Good morning. Again, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for joining us. For the record, my name is Andrea Cohen. I'm with Vermont Electric Cooperative. Um, I think we're good with technology. That's great. Um, good morning. Um, for those of you who are not that familiar with BEC, we're the uh, second largest utility in the state of Vermont. We're a member-owned, not-for-profit utility. And we're the whole northern part of the state. We go from the islands all the way to Canaan up to the Canadian border. Um, and our primary interest is a nonprofit uh, utility, a uh, member of utility. I'm going to see if I can manage this. Let's see, hold on. Oh, just scroll. Okay. It's actually not a piece it's a pad. Um, is um, our, our, our primary goal is to make sure we're, we're providing safe, reliable, cost effective. Uh, and environmentally responsible electric service. And, um, you know, our service territory is very rural and it's very low income, where a lot of the state is rural and low income. Ours is particularly uh, rural and low income. Um, almost 40% of our members are on fixed incomes, which is incredible when we do our member survey. And um, out of the top 10 towns in the state that are low income and the th out of the three of the five uh, counties that are the lowest income are in our service territory. So sometimes people ask us about our low income strategy and we say everything we do is our low income strategy. Um, you know, our goal is to keep rates as low as possible so we can meet the needs of the low income Vermonters and the rural businesses. So that's, um, and doing that while we're meeting our state requirements and aspirational goals around renewable energy and carbon. Uh, we've worked really hard to keep the rates stable. We haven't had a rate increase in, since January 2014. I'll let you know that's not going to stick forever because uh, we're kind of running out of ideas, frankly. But um, over the last 10 years, our rate increase has been an average of less than 1% a year. We're, we're really proud of that because, um, again, given the demographics of our service, service territory. Uh, the bill today that we're talking about, H-423, um, where you're trying to bring more renewable energy to public institutions, the state of Vermont, municipalities, schools, nonprofits. Um, if you take away anything from my testimony today, in BEC service territory, we already have an option for all of those entities to go solar. So our big posi you know, our position on this bill is that we don't need to expand net metering to do that. We already have a co-op community solar program, and I'll talk about the program and what, why we think it's so great. We're very proud of the program. We work really hard to bring this option to our members. Um, what we like about the program is it brings low-cost, local renewable energy to all of the cooperative members. It, it's, this is going into our power supply as part of our portfolio. And we're doing it in a way um, at, at market rates. So we are essentially went out to bid. We have contracts for this energy that uh, is competitive at market rates. So we're not paying more than we need to to bring the local renewable energy to our members. So we're really thrilled about that because we want to do renewable energy. We just don't want to pay more than we need to. Why, why would we, right? So um, we, we purchase this energy at market rates. Um, we offer the members, let's kind of think of it as like a CSA, like a food CSA. You pre-buy and then you get a fixed monthly bill credit. Uh, you can pre-buy by financing and still come out ahead, so you don't have to have all the money up front. There's ways to do this. But essentially, you get a fixed monthly credit on your electric bill for 10 or 20 years, depending on uh, which, which you want. Um, you have access to the financing options. And the beauty of this program is you can opt out at any time for any reason. So you're doing this, and you change your mind you can get basically paid back prorated share of what you paid in at any time, no questions asked. It's also really great because if you're a renter or you just don't have a, a home that's suitable to host solar, this is an opportunity for you as well. So it's open to everybody and it um, brings value to the whole co-op. Um, we have three projects in the program right now. Uh, one is in Alberg, one is in Grand Isle, one is in Hinesburg. We have just over seven megawatts in the program in the three different uh, <coughs> sites. What we really also like about this, outside of it being cost effective for the co-op members, um, we can site the projects and have them sized appropriately for our service territory. They're in locations that are near load, 
So they're, they're sighted effectively and they're sized effectively. We're, we're, we're kind of able to do all those things because frankly we're controlling the, the project. Uh, we, we don't own or operate them. We contract, uh, we got essentially a PPA. Um, we currently have 28,000 panels. About 13% of them are sponsored, so we still have capacity. If you know a school, you know a business, you know, you know an entity that is a, a member that might want to get it, we're very happy to talk to them about it. Um, and um, you can basically sponsor the equivalent of your annual electric bill. So uh, including, you know, customer charges, everything else, we can get you to a point where your bill is zeroed out. Uh, and like I said, we have a financing partner. So it's cost effective. Yeah. And you, you're welcome to ask questions as I'm going. Yeah, I'm just trying to compare and contrast. Between net metering? And this program. But yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get there. The yeah. Okay. Um, so it's cost effective, it's well sited, and it's uh, it, we retire all the racks, so it's renewable energy that goes towards our renewable energy standard. Yeah, um, so this is not net metering, it so is there, not there net is no metering. limit on um, how much a school district, for instance, could purchase into it. Right? right, you could go up to your entire bill. Okay. Um, we, when we first launched the program, we had a limit of 60 or 67 panels, depending on which program, because we didn't know what kind of the uptake and we didn't mm -hmm. want to, people to get shut out. We still have that limit for large commercial, because we don't want like one entity to like buy out the whole thing, but uh, for public and schools and whatnot, there's, it's up to your full bill. Um, I mentioned um, it's inclusive because if you don't have a good site for solar, you can leave at any time and it's affordable. And I won't go into the detail here, but in your packet you can see these are, this is just an excerpt of like the rate sheet basically. Uh, and you can, you know, see how that works if we have time and, and there's questions. So. These are two of the three, Alberg and Heinsberg. Uh, these are the smaller ones, the one megawatt and the 1.3 megawatt. So they're permitted and operational in the Grand Isles uh, over five megawatts. So how does it compare to net metering and why do we prefer this? Um, net metering, uh, just a little background, net metering in uh, VEC territory does continue at, at a good pace. Um, and I think some of our policy positions around net metering is a little mis misconstrued in the media. We have no problem and we're very happy to support kind of the smaller scale. You know, the rooftop, the, the residential, you know, they're not our problem. It's the big ones and this bill speaks to, you know, larger projects. That's where there's rate, there's, there's, there's cost pressures and we feel like there's other options that are better for, for the membership. So just to, um, you know, I can summarize a little bit here about the status of net metering and not going too into the weeds. Um, we had the data for 2017 and then I just added the 2018. But essentially, in 2017, when we first started looking at this, in that year, um, we had more net metering than we ever had all the years before that. So you can say 2017 was pretty, pretty robust. Uh, it turns out that the same is the case in 2018. Uh, we had the program open the entire year and we had the same number of applications, but the interesting column to look at is the, the percent of applications compared to the percent of capacity. Um, so basically the number was the same, but the uh, um, amount of net metering capacity that was applied for was larger. So. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't have that yeah. term. The capacity, you know, right. the metering capacity. I'm not with you. There. Two 15 kW applications, if you put them together, that's 30 kW. That's the total capacity of all the applications. So all the applications, just looking at 2017, we had 389 applications, but the amount of solar that was being applied for or renewable was 5,000 plus. And you'll see in 2018, we have even lo larger amount being applied for. Now, this is just applications. Not all of them happen. Not all are granted. You know, so this is just what I could have pulled easy um, in, in anticipation. Yeah. So what is the percent of capacity to refer to? Uh, right. So all those, so you see on the left, the, the, you got small, medium, and large, let's mm -hmm. just say, projects. 
and the percent of applications, so if you're looking at 2017, 96% of the applications were for the small ones, but only 34% of what was being applied for was the small ones. You understand? So more smaller ones, but not as much energy mm -hmm. being so, produced. So you've got 2,593 kilowatts of capacity there in uh, the small ones and 2,240 on the oh. large ones. Oh. And uh, the yeah. percent of capacity is 34% for the 2,500 and 62% for yeah. the 2,200, so I don't understand. Yeah, you know what, I think I might have a typo in there because that doesn't make sense. Let's look at 2018. Um, they're very similar, I know, so something must have been, I must have done some bad math. Um, you could see, like, uh, in 2018, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, I apologize for that, that the smaller ones and the larger ones are about the same, right, in terms of capacity and, and the uh, percent of capacity. So, um, so, you know, the number of applications continue, and in 2017, the, the total capacity was more than we ever had before, and it's keeping pace. So, you know, uh, I just want to share net, net metering is robust and does continue, uh, and it's about 25% of our peak right now is just net metering. And again, to reiterate, the small ones, the rooftops, and that's not what you're talking about here in this build. You know, that's not what we're talking about. It's problematic from cost pressures as much. It's really the larger ones. And the larger ones do continue to make up the majority of the capacity. So in 2017, um, the larger ones were 4% of the applications and 66% of the capacity, the, the medium and the large. And I'll check that total capacity number because that's wrong. Um, so the large ones are continuing to make up a large percentage of the capacity. And um, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is we must take it and we must pay what the rate is set, and we don't have an uh, opportunity to, to maybe put it out to bid or be competitive. So um, we have no ability to negotiate like we did with our projects where we got really competitive market-based rates. So uh, for the larger projects, um, the last time we ran the numbers, and here's a cost comparison, and again, depending on how much time uh, we have this morning, um, we originally were paying over 60% more for net metered renewable energy than what we were paying in our own community solar program under our negotiated PPA. With net metering 2.0, the gap's gotten smaller, and but we're still paying over 30% more for net metered renewable energy, which is kind of like the same energy. You know, it's there and it's there, and it's just because we're able to negotiate and we're able to do the projects the way we want to do it. Uh, so, Andrew, under these projects where the, the community projects where people can buy in, the rate at which they buy in, is that, um, does that vary year by year? No, it's a just... set rate. Um, and that sheet, a few back, you can see um, they pay up front, mm -hmm. either directly or through financing, and they essentially get a set bill credit every month for the term of the 10 years or 20 years, whichever one. And they can go everywhere from one panel to, you know, their full bill. And they get that set. So it doesn't matter the, the generation. It doesn't matter if it's a sunny day or not a sunny day. They're going to be able mm -hmm. to know that they'll get the same amount every month. We're taking the risk. Um, so how much does it cost them to buy into a, into one, a panel? One panel is $234 under the 10-year program and $412 under the 20. For the tw so, so, so you get the same they, amount. They pay that amount up front, mm -hmm. and then they get this annual credit. They get a monthly bill credit. So if they, OK. OK, so over 10 years, they're getting uh, $326. Uh, total credit. So and you see over they, here. Save ninety-one dollars because. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Um, if you can't call it an investment, it's not an investment. The securities, mm -hmm. you know, that's it's not. But it's a sponsorship with a fixed bill credit every month for mm -hmm. that amount of time. Um. So we must take. 
this chart here was meant to just show, if you just look at that first row, uh, net metering 1.0, net metering 2.0, what we're paying under our PPA, and what standard offer uh, is. And the woman who helped me pull this together is on jury duty, so if you have questions, I'll have to get back to you tomorrow on that one. But the point is 19 cents, 15 cents, 11 cents, or 10 cents, you'd rather pay as little as possible for this. And what's the bottom uh, portion of the table? The last 15 years portion. The last. Uh, so we're on the, on the right. Side. I think First they adjust. The program, so last much. 15 years. Right. Our um, agreement changes with our our contract has a different value over the course of the contract with our our contractor, our PPA. So, yeah. So just to be clear, so I understand what the numbers mm -hmm. are. So. Um, if a customer signs up uh, with the city for a net metering project today, um, the price per kilowatt hour that BEC is paying is 0.15417. No. Believe so, but um, GMP might be able to answer that better. I'm looking at 2.0. 2.0. We're in 2.0. 2.0 is 0.13. Right. 0.15. Okay. That's how much you would pay. That's what we're paying. Right. And you get the rec with that? Yes. Then how much do you sell the rec? Those markets are changing. We're getting less. And again, um, I'm not the best person to answer that, but I can. Can you answer that when you testify? Um, yeah, Monica can um, answer the previous question. Okay. The rec uh, I mean, I'm just wondering yeah. is it two cents? Is it three cents? Five cents? It used to be three cents. Oh, we're, well, we're not selling the ones. You're retiring. Right. Right. We're retiring. We're retiring ours. Okay. But the market itself, I don't know what Rex are these days. Three cents? Three cents, maybe? Yeah. But sure. we're retiring everything that comes through our community solar program. We're using it towards our renewable energy goals. Yeah, I just, again, I want to be clear on the economics of it. So right. um, you don't sell any Rex? Not from our community solar program. And what about that metering? No. Okay. So you retain all this. So I, I believe we're retaining all. You're not them. allowed to sell the rent. Yeah, not okay. allowed metering. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So that was, that was Yeah. So for clarification, the uh, net metering 2.0 with Rex means that you get the Rex, right? Correct. Okay. And if if the um, if the person who's net metering doesn't allow you to take the Rex, then what is the price? Yeah. Um, it goes down it for It goes them, down. Right? I don't think that's happening. Like, okay. I don't think we All have right. that situation. And, and the other question I have is, when you say the standard offer is $0.10, cents, mm -hmm. um, that's for new standard offer that's projects, That's new right? for the solar, because we were just trying to do a little comparing apples to apples. So for okay. you know, solar and through standard offer. standard offer projects being, um, being done in your territory? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are. Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll speak, though, um, we are, uh, starting to intervene in the ones, and we have started to intervene in things in the Shi'i. I mean, you're a little familiar mm -hmm. with that, I imagine. Yep. Um, so, you know, if if we're going to pay m more than we want to, um, you know, it's not only that we're paying more than we need to to bring renewable energy. We're just we also have a, a concern again with the larger projects are the ones I'm more concerned because it's a you know. The, the folks, there's fewer off takers for these large projects. And what happens is, yeah, they're, they're saving some money, but somebody else has to pick that up because we're paying more. So, um, you know, you, you hear some discussion about the cost shift. And again, our concern, again, is with larger projects. Um, there's fewer members when we, when we looked, the last time we looked of uh, the five, five hundreds that were online, um, they had only 10 members that were benefiting. You know, so that wasn't the low-income residential person. You know, that that was the folks that had the capacity to get their act together to you know be an off-taker, and um, so that's a concern. So we're paying more than we want, as well as uh, that gets shifted to folks who often are already struggling to get their bills paid, and we just don't want to keep doing that. Um, so um, a lot of folks might ask. You know, what is this really costing you? You know, what, what's the impact on your rate increase? And those are all fair questions. And 
for I, I just spoke to our finance person. Um, you know, the, the, the reason we included this was to show we're paying more. Now, well, how does that translate to rates? Um, well, our rates haven't gone up in five years, so I can't say X percent of our rate increase was due to that. I can say it is a cost pressure, and we are doing everything we can to sharpen our pencils to, you know, mitigate any kind of upward pressure on rates like everybody. And uh, so I can certainly say this doesn't help. The last time we looked, um, we had, uh, they looked at those five, five, Hundreds, and that looked like over four million dollars over the 25 years. So we can, you know, try to pull numbers here and there for you. It's it's really hard to isolate um, what percentage of a rate rate increase this might be. Um, I'll ask you, but this might be a better question for Robert or or somebody else. Just looking for if you can walk me through um, how the billing works with net metering. I mean, <laughs> but you know, if, if I yeah. so, I have a small residential project yeah. in my house. What I'm generating and consuming at that time is not. Well, I'm, the question is: Is that it doesn't meter roll and back your meter and Monica, but maybe I'll just wait yeah. for. It's it's very complicated billing. You have a generation meter, and then you have a whole other meter. I think that's and the crucial top. to understanding this. Uh, I have another question that uh, has to do with uh, how many school districts or municipalities have actually uh, applied to do net metering projects? I can get back to you on that. I'd have to look in our, yeah. we have, you know, like 1,300 net metering right. members and, and how and many I, are schools? And I'm wondering, I'm wondering uh, whether, you know, compare, um, as far as net metering goes, how does that compare to the number of schools or municipalities that bought into your uh, yeah. power purchase agreement right. projects? So, so net meter, I'll, I'll send an email in with, with that data. Um, okay. We, we uh, have a pretty lean operation and we don't do a lot of marketing of our programs, so we often find a lot, I mean we do it in newsletters and whatnot, but um, a lot of times when we have an opportunity, if you know a school that might be interested, we'd love to talk to them and give it to them as an option. So somebody, if, if a school uh, decided, a school district decided that they wanted to to put solar on their property, mm -hmm. um, would you then try to talk them into buying part of that We're, seven megawatts? We, we like to let them know all their options. We don't do a hard sell on anyone. You know, that well, I'm not our, saying do a hard sell, right. but you let them know what the, talk uh, them that, into, you, that you could, uh, that they could buy into that. Yes. As opposed to putting it on their own building. We, we try to make, let everybody know about the availability of the program. Sometimes uh, folks come in, they already have a relationship with a developer. They want to do net metering. We don't, you know, do anything to try to slow them down or you know they're we're a member owned member you know so whatever is the best option for you is what we want to support our members so and is there a, is there a still capacity for members to buy into the seven megawatts yes we have 13 percent of of all of the capacity is sponsored so we have more capacity so you have 87 percent left mm -hmm. Now, the, the good news, what we really like about this program is whether anybody sponsors or not, we are buying this renewable energy. It mm -hmm. is being produced and it's going into our power supply. Right. So it's really just a matter of, of if there's a member that wants to take advantage of the sponsorship opportunity, they're really committed to going solar. They're already getting solar energy through our power supply, but you know, if they want to really commit and, and, and be a partner in this project, they can. They have so right now, you, um, the Mon Electric Co-op and any other utility has a requirement of uh, being uh, at least uh, 57 or 60 percent uh, renewable energy that you have to retire to RECs for. Um, do you have excess RECs that you then sell into the market? We have sold RECs and we will uh, if we don't need them just mm -hmm. because we don't like to leave money on the table. Again, we're trying not to have rate increases, so we play by the rules. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're meeting our exceeding so we can, you know, find value for our members and that way we will. So, okay. so that gets back to my earlier question and, and uh, 
you know, I'm, not, I'm certainly not confident in my uh, knowledge of very specifically how the net metering economics work, but if you have extra recs and have them available to sell into the market, and you're purchasing net metering power uh, with the recs um, that are two, three, whatever, you know, whatever the rec is worth, um, thinking about the fungibility of the rec that you may retain relative to that specific power that allows you to sell another rec. Right. Um, what I'm trying to understand is the economics of the net metering that, you know, is truly the net cost of the net metering power you're buying that allows you to sell another rec in your portfolio equal to the net metering cost you're paying less the uh, value of the rec that you can sell elsewhere in your portfolio. I think I got three quarters of the way through that with you because I was saying we're also using recs potentially for tier three. Sure. We don't retire the net metering rec, so it means, I mean, we do retire the net metering rec, so we're not selling those. So if that frees up other recs, we can use either sell them or use them for tier three if we need them. It gives us, which which is nice, you know, it gives us opportunity to be a little nimble and be responsive, which we kind of need, you yeah. know. Um, and if I'm missing some part of this, somebody else can, you know, fill in. But so what I'm trying to get down to again, just to kind of level yeah. set on a factual basis, right? Um, the headline cost for net metering power um, is clearly more than other power that you can purchase. Um, what I'm trying to get to is <coughs> net metering power that you would purchase above 500 kilowatt level, how much would that cost relative to a you know, 15 kW? I um, mean, I think there's differences in the, the um, so, so that's one question. Um, but then also trying to understand truly what the net cost of that net metered power is um, if it allows you to sell recs elsewhere in your portfolio. Um, so, and, you know, again, we've got limited That's time to talk through this. That's what part of this was trying yeah. to do some apples to apples. And it's helpful. It's helpful. It just, it, I'm not quite there in terms right. of understanding the net cost. Of so power. digging into net metering value, you know, we often also will say, we need to look at all sides. And how much does it cost to put that, like, you know, transparency and openness. Like, when we go out to bid, we know we're getting a commitment. If we were at a must-take must buy at oh, you guys or PC is setting a rate and it doesn't change, that doesn't allow us to, you know, really go with like low cost. Like so how much does it cost to put that yep. energy in the system? Uh, that's kind of the other part of the equation that's not necessarily transparent. Yeah. It seems like the most expensive net meter power you buy is from the small projects. Um, uh, larger projects you pay less for net meter power. Or no, we pay the same. Rate. Okay. And above five, if the cap is lifted, above 500 kW. Oh, right. Go ahead. So if the cap was lifted. Yeah. And so you're buying power, uh, net metered power from larger projects. This is just generally a question I have. I don't know if we've thought through this in terms right. of how this bill would work, but um, the, the price that would be paid for net metered power above in a larger um, project. Okay. You know, our, so I think net, somebody else should talk about net metering 2.0 and compensation, okay. just to make sure you get the right information, because yeah. that is not You're the unlucky person being the first. It's lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> so, you know, above 500, you know, I guess the whole purpose of the testimony is to say, when you're getting bigger, let it be competitive. Let yeah. it be open. Let us get catch the best price we can get. That's what we do. Yeah. Uh, and we do it well, and we've kept rates down, and... You know, the more we have that flexibility to do that, provided people can go solar. I mean, we're not trying to stand in the way. We just don't want to pay more than we need to. Yeah, and it's just fundamentally, and I guess this is for other folks who are going to be testifying in addition to information we'll collect in future days, a fundamental issue that we're getting our arms around mm -hmm. here is, does it cost more to purchase net meter power? Um, I'm hearing the answer is yes. Yes. And I'm trying to get very specific about how much more. And, uh, you know, again, there's a headline rate to that, um, you know, 
I think fifteen point four one seven cents. Dig into um, that. But you know, truly understanding what what are the costs embedded in and that. the value. Yeah. You're you're speaking yeah, what's value. the value and so the cost, the value. You know, that's that's good things to yep. you know dig into. Great. Right. We're happy to be part of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. What question? I'm sorry. Did you? I think. Um, okay. What? Go ahead. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't expect you to have this off the top of your head, but I'm, I'm looking for some, I, I guess I'd call it demographic information, and I would be asking the same from Green Mountain Power, uh, which is I'd like to know uh, the percent of your customers or meters that are residential, and then the percent of your meters that are uh, commercial, large, industrial, et cetera. You know, it, uh, broken out that way, and then uh, the percent of your total revenue that comes from the residential, and the percent of the total revenue that comes from the other classes. We sell half of our gener half of our sales is commercial, and half is residential. What okay. people are often surprised about because we're pretty rural. Okay. But uh, the number of meters. I'll have to get back to you on. There's a lot more residential, but we sell the same amount of power. Um, I, I think one of the things that this bill is trying to address is um, specifically school murders. Um, you know, last year we had disparate entities that each could do their own 500, um, and now next year it'll be one entity, which theoretically would be capped at 500 for the whole unit. So how can we make that... Uh, how is that going to impact the grid, um, the economics, and what can we do to make that fair, while at the same time being cognizant that you know a, a single entity last year doesn't pretend to be five disparate entities a, next year to be able to game the system. So uh, kind of, but for the merger, they could have right. You don't want them to lose by merging. To, exactly. Right, right. And you're not necessarily talking about on site systems. You're not saying. I think most of the school ones are on site, right? I'm looking at the guys that might have more information mm -hmm. on that. But um, yeah. whether it's on site or not is. Yeah, like whether they're off takers is different than like larger projects. Like we have a lot more concerns about like larger projects and locations that aren't strategic right. electrically. And so there's like a paperwork, you know, uh, accounting difference, like, but maybe not a reality difference in terms of like size of actual projects and where they're located. Those right. are two different things for, for us. It, it, perhaps the, the ideal solution would be um, one location, one meter gets one cap, and it's based on production f that's consumed on that site or something instead of relying on the grid to transport it. You know, across the county year. Yeah, I mean, most of these systems are right integrated <laughs> with the grid because the sun isn't always shining. You know, we, we talk about the grid uh, being the back, being the battery. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to be off grid, you could do that. But you know, until the batteries come down in price and whatnot, it's going to be tricky to not need the grid. But, so right, I, I want to make sure that we let. Yeah, get to your out. other witness. Yeah, you know, leave a little meat on the bone for Robert. Please do. And and for clarifying the details of net meter in 2.0, because I'm not an expert at that, in terms of what the compensation is, you might want to make okay. sure you get that. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Appreciate it. One more? You have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> If it's okay, can I just have Monica join Please, that table? please, that'd be great. Um, if, we, if we could maybe switch chairs. Welcome. Thanks for coming Thank here. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, so I'm Robert Dostas with Green Mountain Power, and with me is Monica Trombley. So um, I brought Monica in case there were any questions about the billing. I told her there probably won't be. <laughs> <laughs> you tricked me. <laughs> but she got it before she even got up here. So, uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to start um, with just sharing some slides and information that you probably already heard of or have seen. 
But I just think it's really important that we identify what the real challenge that we have before us and what we really need to tackle as a state and truthfully as just a human species, right? Um, as you well know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report in October of 2018, right? 6,000 um, scientific papers, 91 authors, 40 different countries, all saying we got some real significant problems and we need to do something about it, otherwise the worst is going to happen, and then they kind of spell out what the worst is. We are set to um, hit an increase in global temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're gonna, that's gonna happen, right? Now what the panel is saying, uh, if we go above that, what are the consequences gonna be? And, and we have an opportunity, but we ha uh, when this report was released, they said we had 12 years, now it's 11 and a half years and the clock is ticking to keep us to below 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. Really should put my glasses on. It's bad. <laughs> um, so increasing, so this, I mean, we know about these fires. Increasing global temperatures above 1.5 degrees Celsius hit in two degrees Celsius will significantly worsen the risk of drought, floods, extreme heat, and worldwide consequences for human and of course all life that lives on this planet. This to me is one of the more shocking kind of facts. And while I was aware of the impact that climate change was having on our coral reefs, I wasn't aware of the magnitude. I wasn't aware that by 2050, 90% um, of all coral reefs in the world will be dead, right? Um, that's gonna happen. What we have before us now, the choice we have, we can cut our carbon emissions. We can at least save the last 10%. Why are coral reefs important? Not only are they very pretty, I have a little fish tank. Uh, my little fish tank may be, ha be used to kind of repopulate the oceans at some point. Um, I say that jokingly, but you know, I've always thought about that, and I see the beauty in my little fish tank, and really what it encompasses, and just think about the reefs that we're having, what we're losing, it's really a shame. 25% of all known marine life depends on coral reefs. 50% of the Great Barrier Reefs are right now dead or dying. Um, and 90% of our reefs will be dead by 2050 and dying up till then and the question is, can we save the last 10%? The author of this um, article, um, I'm just quoting her here, there were startling colors here just a year ago, a dazzling array of life beneath the waves. Now this Mal <coughs> Maldivian reef is dead, killed by stress of rising temperatures. The world has lost roughly half of its coral in the last 30 years, and this, I mean, obviously it has significant impacts for ecosystems. Um, the marine life that depend on that, as well as the half billion people around the world who also depend on, on reefs, on these reefs. Robert, can I, can I just, yeah. so when you say if we can cut our carbon emissions, you're talking about the world. The world, yeah, okay. absolutely, Thanks. the world. And this, this, I do link this to 423. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what we done with this book. And yeah, it's just really. Can I reuse your slides, by the way? Absolutely. Right? <laughs> and what I found is, yeah, it's, you just Google, right? Just ask the question. Yeah, you know, reefs are impacted by climate change, and boom, you get all these articles that come up. Um, Yemen has been in a severe drought, and um, this same report says that the event like drought will become even more frequent and devastating under 2.0 warming compared to 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So I, I kind of, I wanted to, the oceans, the world, I mean, it's affecting everybody, right? And it, here at home, I don't know if you heard, it was last week, this week, a brave little state did a report on climate change and the impact that it's happening here in Vermont. And it's real. And what's happening is what... Oh, that was on VPR, right? VPR, what did I say? No, 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 no. Yes. You just didn't say it. Okay, VPR, yes, thank you. Um, and um, we're, what the scientists have said is going to happen in Vermont 
more severe weather, more wet weather, more precipitation, it's happening. And you know, as an electric utility, you know, we monitor the weather all the time and we prepare for storms. We've gotten really good at preparing for storms. Those storms have been more fierce, they have been wetter. They, we've had, I think, over the past five years, four of our worst storms ever in our history have happened in the past five years. So it's having a significant impact. It's only going to get worse. We are taking precautions to harden our system. We're even now looking at places we can underground stuff um, because actually technology has changed and becoming more cost competitive to do that in certain, in certain areas. Um, last night I was down in Putney having a meeting with all the fire chiefs and emergency management folks to talk about how we communicate during storms and what we need to do after storms is happening during the restoration period and what can we expect moving forward as these storms get more severe and outages get more widespread and resources get thinner it's going to be a whole different challenge and we're starting to have these conversations because communities need to start thinking differently about how people survive in the aftermath of a major storm when power outages are going to take a lot longer to get restored so it was a good conversation but it was only the first of many So reducing your carbon footprint, it's something we've all talked about. And this slide here came from Energy Action Network, and it, it tells you what you already know. And, and there's been a lot of folk in the conversation about this in this building. We know that our carbon is coming from our transportation sector and from our building thermal sector. Um, electric generation is a very small percentage now of carbon emissions. We have a pretty green portfolio. Um, we have two utilities that are 100% renewable. GMP, as you know, is 90% carbon free, about 60% renewable. Everybody is meeting or exceeding the renewable energy requirements that we have in the state, one of the largest renewable energy requirements in the country. So we're doing really well in that regard. In these other sectors, we're not doing well. How this links to 423, if you're going to give public institutions, and that list is pretty long, access to the net metering program to get more renewable generation, they're going to derive a financial benefit from that, right? That's why they're doing it. Rather than them simply taking that financial benefit and maybe reducing a tax or something, require that they take that money and invest it into carbon reducing technologies, programs, whether that's electric vehicle or new heating system, whatever it is, let them use that, that money to reduce carbon because simply building another solar project is not reducing our carbon footprint because we already have a very clean portfolio. But if we use that as a vehicle to reduce carbon, then there'll be some societal benefits for the money that other customers are paying to make that happen. So that, that's, like, that's our request if this bill is moving forward to tie this in a way that actually helps to reduce carbon because, and that was the purpose of all those slides I showed before, because it is, I mean, I, even though I know about climate change and I take it very seriously and have for a long time, there was something about going through and doing this little bit of research yesterday to get these slides that really drove this home and said, holy cow, we actually, we have 11 and a half years to save 10% of coral reefs. So, um, and one way to do that is we, we, we combine our policies in a way or undertake energy policies in a way that ensures that we're reducing our carbon. And to the point, you know, this is just Vermont, and we all have to do our part, and there's no, well, they're not doing it, so we should. It's like, we got to do everything we possibly can, and, and hopefully others will do the same, and in the end, as, as I hope, people learn about the challenge before us, because I'll tell you, still there are many people out there who don't know about this challenge that we have. The more they learn, the more they understand what we, as, as, as utilities, as a state, as individuals are trying to do, they'll get on board and help us achieve that as well. Um, so uh, specifically on H423, uh, on H and why I brought Monica with me, there's, um, there's language in here that says that a public institution may participate in more than one group net meter, right? And that's how you seemingly will get uh, a, 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 an, an a public ent entity to get more, to participate more in the group net metering program or be a, have no limit on the amount of energy or credits they can get from a group net meter project. 
Right now, an institution can have multiple groups. And this is going to get really confusing to me. Um, and that's why Monica's here to kind of straighten me out. So you can have an institution, one institution, so the town of X, right? Um, and town of X has multiple accounts because they have a meter at their water treatment facility, they have a meter at the ballpark, they have a meter on their municipal building, right? Each one of them is a separate account, right? It's all part of, though, the town of X. Um, right now, the town of X can have belong to multiple groups, but no one account can belong to multiple groups. So you may have, let's say, have 10 accounts. <coughs> Each account is part of a different group. Then the town of X has 10 different groups. But each account is only has one group. We want to make sure that stays that way. And, and that would have to be clarified, I think, in the language, because if an account were part of more than one group, <coughs> we would not, we do not have the ability to bill it. And, and there would be a significant challenge that we would have to overcome to actually even first figure out how to do it, and then to actually implement it would be quite resource intense. So, so, so uh, if you've got a new school district that has seven buildings now, does each building have its own account? If, um, most likely it does. Each building will have its own, own meter, so its own account. And in that case, any one of those accounts could, could be, be part of a group. Now, right now, that's, that's that limited. They, they, they don't. Right, they could be part of the same group or they could be part of different groups. I mean, the difficulty is when you have one, one account that's, if you kind of think of it, it's a person and a premise, a person and a location. So one location, um, getting allocation or, or generation from two different groups is, is kind of a difficult concept from a billing perspective. So in this 500 book, uh, total what? Um, are you saying that it doesn't necessarily apply to merged districts because they've got probably multiple buildings and everything? Yeah. Well, um, I think, so the merged issue, so right now, let's say before the merger, each one of those schools, and let's make it easier, it's just two buildings, right, so two accounts. Each one of those schools, different districts, has a 500 kilowatt cap. Right. If you were to combine them, right, and now they're under one entity, mm -hmm. then presumably, then that 500 kilowatt cap would apply, and then that school would lose that opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, so you've done that limited of them. Um, but if that's if that's the issue you're trying to address, that's an easy fix, right? You just you just allow each school when they merge to maintain maintain their 500. Their 500. So you. you They'd be able to exceed one entity would be able to exceed the cap for schools and public institutions. In the cases of the merger, right? Uh, I'm really confused. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, it, it sounded like. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, Laura, go around. Sorry. Did you have a question? Sure. Now, right? I just want to make sure that I'm with you okay. on the accounts. So, count is like that's somebody's getting a bill. That's what right. an account is. Right. And so, right. and it's one location. So it's the meter at your house. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's not integrated into you know seven different seven different locations. It's that one location. So I don't actually know it in rural Vermont. So like, would a potentially a larger a consolidated district get one bill for all of their buildings now? Um, or would they get separate bills? They would have separate bill? bills. So then each one of those would be a separate account. Right. So do we even have a problem with well, um, only Again, in, 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 no, but if you are consolidating, then that's the question that's raised. Does it mean that then, so if you are all a separate account, each one of you is a separate account, and then used to merge, you still get to get your 500, and you get to get your 500. So, so right now, so I have a merge district. Mm -hmm. Dover has a system. Wardsboro, don't believe Wardsboro has a system. They've merged into one governance unit. They have two different buildings. I think we'll have two different bills for each of the mm -hmm. buildings. 
And so right now, with that merger, can Wardsboro still do a project? In your opinion? That's a good question. If again, it's because that's the problem yeah. we're trying to solve right, yeah, is to make sure right. Wordsboro can still do that. So if, in my mind, right? So it's the customer. It's the customer that has the five hundred kilowatt limit, right? And the customer could have multiple accounts, right? So if the, so, the customer would be the new the merged new, yeah, district, yeah, right. exactly. That has two accounts. Yes. And so we want to make sure each of those accounts can get what they could have got do, before. Right. Yes. Right. And so the question is, can they? Are they prohibited? I would think they would be. They would be? Well, it depends on the size of the system, if it's over the 500 right. kW or the combination of systems. Oh, yeah. because the, the right. right, it's the cap. So, uh, but it's, uh, they would, yeah, so if if you two, separate schools, each one of go net metering and you have enough load and you each want to do 500, you can do that, right? You're two separate Entities, two separate customers, customers. Two separate customers, thank you. Stop using so many words. Two separate customers. Now you merge, congratulations. Um, now you merge. <laughs> and now you call yourselves something different. Customer Y, right? Customer Y is one entity, one customer. So you presumably would be limited now to just 500. Of course, if you had already had hit the max before, you come in together, now you're at full megawatt. So the limit is on the customer, not the account. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. And so what we're trying to do, theoretically, is allow the customers allow to the customers to hit the limit as opposed to the no, no. allow the no. accounts no. Okay. to hit the limit as opposed to the customer. Yes. In That's the case of the merged district. Yes. Yeah. In the case of a merged district. Rather than this guy. I want to step back from this particular batch of weeds. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that, so we are looking at net metering as the goal. And, and I want to step back to the goal being affordable, renewable energy for all customers, net metering being one of the tools to accomplish that. And Andrew pointed this out in, in her testimony. And I'm wondering, um, is net metering the, the best tool mm -hmm. for that? It's, I mean, it's great for distributed power generation, but I'm wondering at the 500 kW level mm -hmm. where these problematic uh, issues are at, is net metering the best tool to accomplish that larger goal mm -hmm. of affordable renewable energy? You know, the, the, um, the lens that we are looking through now, obviously it's the carbon lens, which is there go my presentation, but it's also the resiliency lens, lens. So, as I said, things are changing, right? And the more resilient we become as a state, the better. Well, what does resiliency mean? Resiliency means that we don't solely rely on the electric lines and poles, you know, um, for our power all the time because they got to come down. So resiliency means having generation that is near load or right on the load, so on the building, behind the building, or near enough to the business, the community, so that as technology continues to change and new battery storage opportunities come to play and costs come down, we can, we can microgrid the home, the business, the community, the state of Vermont, then that'll improve our resiliency. So to me, it's, it's the size is important to the extent that it helps to achieve that objective. So if having a large system, like we have, we're building a five megawatt, we have, no, it's a two point something megawatt facility down in Rutland, right, attached to battery storage, that will serve as a microgrid for the local school, which is also emergency shelter. My home, I have Powerwall battery and I have solar. Power goes out, and it's gone out a couple times recently. Seven minutes, a couple days ago. Um, Did you say seven minutes? Seven minutes. <laughs> hey, my <laughs> favorite. Um, but I'll have power, and, and I'll have power, you know, as long as there's some sunshine and the, my batteries, I will have power, and I'll have neighbors coming to my door asking to shower. Um, but that's the kind of future that we need to create. So whatever we do, I think we need to keep that in mind, is the investment that we're making in the solar, whether it's net metering or standard offer or just 
solar companies building them and selling their power to utilities, um, putting up on your own roof. What's going to get us closer to more self-sufficiency? That is to me the important question that we have mm -hmm. to ask and answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> what is, the, the question that I had before, uh, what I was confused about, is because I thought you said that the, the cap, the 500, uh, or the you know, 500 kilowatt cap, applied to an account. But then you just clarified that you, your belief is it applies to, to the customer, which is what we understood from our previous testimony. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, but more interesting, really, is, is uh, Robin's question and your and your and your rhetorical question in response: How do we foster the development of viable microgrids mm -hmm. that are more resilient? What what what? Yeah, I would, it's happening. How do how do we how do we how do we do that? So it's happening. I mean, think about think about the well the projects that we're doing. All the large solar projects that we're building, we're coupling with battery storage. We've, a couple of years ago, we, we, um, we unveiled a pilot in partnership with Tesla in rolling out the Tesla Powerwalls, right? We've now, we, we've, before we got involved in that, software did not exist for us to be able to access them and use those batteries to be able to manage the grid with. Well, we can do that now, and we do it actually quite successfully. We've deployed 2,000 of those batteries. We opened that pilot up now, and you have other businesses, solar businesses, other battery businesses who want to get into that space now also being able to sell their batteries and giving us the ability to access them and use them for grid support. And then we're paying them for that purpose. The more of those batteries that we get out there and the more, play and the more players that we have selling those wares, the more that these batteries are going to be sold. And, and we, have, we, have, we have a lot of solar development out there. So there's incredible opportunity for that microgridding with a lot of existing solar generation, as well as more coming online. So, um, so I, I don't solve you to me, about, yeah. but I'm trying to understand how you divvy up the grid to, to, um, to create microgrids, in mm -hmm. fact. Uh, and I guess, I'm you know, just thinking about it, I'm guessing that you have <laughs> legs that go off, you know, down down one road and down another road and whatever. So the way you would create a microgrid is if a tree came down over there, then what's left of this leg, mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to, to still uh, have power, would have to have generation and battery storage. Yes. On, so in effect, on each of these little legs. That might, yes. Is this the right sort of uh, conceptual yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that would uh, suggest that the thing to do is to find ways to 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 incentivize different all the legs, so that so that you create create microgrids. Mm -hmm. Is that is GMP doing that? Is yes. That, that, that what you're, is that yes. What you're on? Yeah. Exactly. So you're identifying places where you need storage and you need generation and finding ways to get. Uh, those customers to, to participate? I, I, I think on, on kind of the bigger, more macro level, we're looking for areas of the state where we know that local generation and battery storage is going to help with resiliency, but also is a more cost-effective way of some other alternatives in dealing with what's ever happening in those locales. And then you have what's happening kind of with the individual homeowner, um, and that's the providing the battery technologies and working with other companies to do the same thing and providing a significant incentive for them to participate. And the value of that incentive that we're offering actually still yields value for all our customers. Right. So it's a win-win-win for everybody. So and now this has only been, you know, again, two years ago I think we started the pilot. I think we deployed a thousand batteries or cells, there's still a thousand in the pipeline that we deployed. So th things are changing pretty rapidly, but we're still pretty in the early stages of all this. Um, I expect, based on what I've heard about the battery technology, battery costs coming down, that we'll see a lot more deployment of that in a relatively short time. And it's going to be the market forces that are going to drive it, but the utility, GMP, has provides that additional incentive to, to kind of facilitate. But you're contacting people that, that, that would benefit your the, 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 right. the grid or yes. the microgrids. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. And not just that, the, the beauty of bringing other businesses into the equation is that now they're also doing their marketing and getting people to buy their packages. But of course, yeah. you're the only one to know where the grids are and how the grids are divvied up. Um, yeah, so on the small scale stuff, yeah, we're, we're not saying, you know, we, well, maybe down the road, we have an issue here. If you put batteries here, there's greater value and we're going to give you some additional That's value. Asking, right? that, I mean, that, that, I'm sure it's part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, I don't, we don't have a game for that plan. Right now, it's like, you want to do a battery, do a battery. Okay. Here's, some, here's some incentive to make that happen. Okay. Mark? Robert, can you elaborate a little bit? You talked about the savings that folks uh, reap from these projects, and, and some of it's substantial from the right. school we just heard the other day. Um, and put that money back into other renewable projects. How, how would that work? What would that look like? Who would make the decisions? What? what, what yeah. Well, that and that's that's. I think that that would need to be figured out. I think if you think it, utilities have a requirement on the tier three, right, to reduce fossil fuels, right? Um, the requirements for that are, are very steep. I will tell you, there's much more than I thought we actually were signing up for, which is good given the problem we have. But I had to like, whoa! I didn't realize that. So they are very very significant in terms of what we need to achieve. What we thought we would be able to do to achieve them doesn't even scratch the surface. Um, which, again, the good news there is that it's forcing us to be very creative in finding new ways in which to reduce carbon. And that's why we're doing so much work with the large fossil fuel users, so large businesses that are, you know, ton, tons of fossil fuels that they use. Tons is not the right word, maybe it is. Gallons, I don't know. Um, to, um, to help them reduce that. So we're looking everywhere. The reason why we're promoting electric vehicles is for the same reason, right? There's so much opportunity there. So um, if these public institutions had a pot of money uh, and they were instructed to work with, and, you know, it could be Efficiency Vermont, if, kind of, if their mandate changes, the utilities, I, um, there's ample opportunity for them to partner with us and others to figure out ways to reduce their carbon. Um, so that's kind of, and the thought, so just the, where this came from partly was a presentation that RAP, uh, the Regulatory Assistance Program, gave um, at one of an EAN event where they were talking about the, a report that was released, right? You probably know this better than I do. I'm not sure if it was the carbon tax report? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah um, and basically what the, the findings was, if you simply just increase the tax, you're not going to kind of get the result that you want. You're not going to see a lower of carbon. But if you take that money and invest it into technologies, programs that reduce carbon, that's where you're going to see the real results happening. So that was the thinking. All right. These, in, these public institutions will get financial benefit from this, paid for by other customers. Well, let them invest in ways that's actually going to have a benefit to all customers, and that is by lowering carbon. Yeah. So that's what just, I think. Uh, I just wonder though if that won't be a deterrent, because if I was a customer voting on a school project mm -hmm. uh, and, and really not realizing that I wasn't going to reap any you know, tax benefit from it, I mean, really, you're looking at if you lift the caps on that metering, there's going to be a cost to all customers. That's you as well, even in your district. If you take away the incentive for that reaping that benefit from having that project, mm -hmm. take that away from them. Um, I, again, I think you know what we're getting into a, a cost increase across the board uh, that, that, to me, might might mm -hmm. be more of a deterrent than it is. Yes, I guess it would depend on the reason why they're deciding to participate in the program and want to get more energy. If it's simply to lower their taxes. Um, then, yeah, this would be a deterrent. Um, but then I would ask the question, is, is that the purpose of the net metering program, to help communities lower their taxes? Um, I'd much rather see that money being used for lowering carbon. And if, if that doesn't fit with the community's desire, then, yeah, then they it probably wouldn't, they wouldn't participate, and that might be fine. I, I would actually look at it, I mean, this is your idea. <laughs> so I'll, give you, I'll give you credit in playing for it. Uh, I would look at it a little more broadly, which is, um, you know, the school district was to invest in a net metering project to lower its, uh, ultimately, its electric bill, uh, but then was plowing some of those savings into, you know, whatever, its, it's thermal efficiency. 
I would presume that that is an investment that is also going to further lower the, not only the carbon footprint, but the costs for that district, whether it's <coughs> energy consumption or you know, however you look at, um, uh, you know, what the, what the energy load is in that facility, whether it's heating oil or further electric purchases. I'm sorry. Yeah, my um, And then we're going to go. So <clears throat> when we're talking about 500 kilowatt uh, cap right now on a school district, <clears throat> um, I'm wondering about the actual load that school districts have. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether 500 kilowatts is just a, a part of that or whether it exceeds what most school districts uh, use in electricity. And what I don't want to do is have school districts get into a uh, situation where they're merchant generators, uh, generating more right. electricity than they consume, right. and then, you know, uh, getting credit for the excess electricity that, uh, right. that then re-increases costs and everything. And I'm also wondering whether whenever we consider a larger project, whether we should require storage to be part of that. Uh, because again, the sun doesn't shine all the time, right. and we need to shave the peak in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the one way to do that is by uh, using storage. Mm -hmm. And large systems seem to be, to me, to be the most cost-effective way of using that storage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the first question I would say, it, it depends on how the school is um, moving forward with the net metering. If they could decide just to pay for a, let's say, a solar array, or it could be a wind turbine, right, mm -hmm. on their roof or in their backyard, and serve their school, right, mm -hmm. directly serve their school, and that's kind of, that's the, that's the genesis of net metering, right, serving load, and then any excess generation it has, is just basically held on the grid until the school needs again to get credited for it. They won't build a solar generator or a wind tower that's going to be greater than what the school uses because they would just lose those credits over time. And that, that's that's intentional, right? You don't want them for you know. To put it <coughs> so that's one way they can do it. More likely is that you'll have a solar company build an array somewhere else. And the school will be the off-taker of that. Now, how much they take from that will depend on their load. And that'll be the conversation between the solar company and the school. If the school only uses 300 kilowatts, right, then they'll get two-thirds of the, the off-taker. And then that solar company is going to look for another school or another entity in which to give the rest or a portion of. We have a net metering. Uh, project down in Brattleboro that has over 100 off-takers. Um, so they'll want to build a larger system because it's more economical, and they're going to try to fill up with you know as few as possible, because of less to administer, and the, but they'll go down the line until they finally got the full amount subscribed. And those off-takers are both uh, municipalities uh, or municipal entities school districts and residential users? M these, but usually it's the large, it's usually, um, and, yeah, no, the large ones, I think, you know, those large systems. Uh, yeah, it could be anything, it could be a mix. Yeah. 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 Uh, this morning. Well, what, what about the store? What oh, about so the requirements? You know, the I, I, and I, one more yeah, I worry about <laughs> I, I worry about requirements because for the same reason I wouldn't want if someone wanted to build a solar facility near kind of their business again, so it's where you want it, and then you have a requirement that batteries and it requires additional investments. Will that deter them from doing the solar? I see this has been a step-by-step -step process. So we've seen incredible growth of solar in the state good thing. Now we're starting to see the battery storage giant being deployed. We'll see more and more of that happen. I don't think we need to require it just yet. We should require more carbon reduction, but that's not. Yeah. 
So if you guys want to answer your question, we also have Melissa coming next. Um, I can ask them when, when they're done if you want to move on okay. to the next one. So, something specific. Yeah, right now. Um, with regards to, you know, kilowatt hours of storage for per kilowatt of generation, is there an ideal ratio for solar or wind that, uh, from a technical perspective, you would like to see in order to have a, a stable microgrid? So you're going to really ask me a qu last question when I have absolutely no clue. Right? <laughs> there you go. But I have somebody who can answer that. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. I've never been given a building question, so I've got a lot more. Okay. Uh, all right. So Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, Melissa Bailey with Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. I will um, try not to retread the ground we've covered this morning and potentially fill in some of the gaps and um, respond to some questions the committee has already raised around. Um, net metering and in the, specifically in the context of Vermont's goals and requirements for renewable energy. Um, quickly, VEPSA, uh, again, is comprised of 12 municipal electric utilities around the state. Um, as public power entities, I would say our key objective is um, serving all customers and ensuring that the, the transition to renewable energy happens in an equitable and sustainable manner with equitable benefits being shared among customers uh, who are also community members in these municipalities. So again, we're nonprofit utilities um, committed to the value of local decision making and fairness among rate, rate payers. Uh, overall, in general, um, with regards to net metering, I would say um, we're cautious of, about um, opening up portions of the net metering rule. Back in 2014, Act 99 was passed, um, charging the PUC with fulfilling a series of criteria in their development of the rule. That process took several years. There was multiple opportunity for stakeholder input, and um, the PUC, I think, was fairly successful in striking a balance, again, in the overall um, net metering rule. And so looking at small portions of the rule, such as the per customer cap, um, risks throwing that out of balance. This is a wordy slide, but again, this is from Section 8010. These are the criteria that were um, legislated through Act 99, and this is what the PUC was charged with doing. As you'll see, there are a series of goals that are um, intended to be met through the net metering rule. Uh, meeting renewable goals is one of them. Minimizing cost shifts is another. And again, um, the PUC worked diligently to try to hit all of these to the extent possible. So these are the statutory criteria, again, um, governing the net metering program in Vermont. What's, what's the end there? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, transmission and distribution. So that would be, again, targeted at if you do site um, net metering close to load, you have the ability to potentially defer or avoid transmission and distribution upgrades. That, um, again, wouldn't be the case if you have remote, larger projects that are remote from load. Also on that same slide, uh, I'm looking at A and B there, advanced Vermont's renewable goals and total renewable targets, and then achieve deployment consistent with energy plan, unless PUC determines energy plan is inconsistent with goals in A. How could the energy plan be inconsistent with the goals in A? So I, my interpretation here is that the legislature is saying if the, so the comprehensive energy plan is something put together by the Department of Public Service, I believe every six years, and if the legislature's view was that the department had not made that plan consistent with um, the statutory goals, oh, okay. the goals and statute would supersede right. the plan. Okay. So the outcome of the Act 99 proceedings that led to the um, net metering 2.0 rule that took effect in 2017 was that the um, PUC concluded it was appropriate to reduce costs over time of the net metering program. They concluded that there is a significant subsidy um, and they included certain cost containment provisions in the rule, one of those being um, limiting any individual customer to 500 kW of capacity of net metering in order to minimize the impacts on other ratepayers that are non-participants. This just shows net metering deployment in um, BEPSA's territories. Uh, we have seen robust deployment um, over and continuing through 2017 and 2018. 
this is as a percent of um, peak, so the peak load for each of those individual systems. So typically between 10 and 20 percent of peak load can be served through net metering systems. We have um, close to 500 projects have been deployed. <coughs> And I did just want to spend a little bit of time on um, net metering in the context of Vermont's renewable policy. So the Renewable Energy Standard, which was an, uh, implemented in 2015, is now seen as the overarching renewable policy for the electric sector in Vermont. And that will dictate um, how much small-scale renewable generation is deployed in Vermont. So that's under Tier 2 of the Renewable Energy Standard, which set a requirement that 1% of um, retail sales ramping up to 10% of retail sales by 2032 be met by small in-state generation. And so the res defines small as under 5 megawatts, and again, it must be located within Vermont. So when we look at net metering, we're looking at net metering in comparison to other um, strategies, other projects and generation that could meet Tier 2 of the RES. The Comprehensive Energy Plan um, recognizes that the res is now the overarching renewable policy. Um, we're around renewable energy generation and um, directs utilities, directs the state to look at um, the cost effectiveness of different, um, different alternatives to meeting all three tiers of the RES. And so getting into um, H423, uh, it's I, from my reading of the bill, um, it's somewhat unclear what the overall goal is, although I think it's, it's one of the stated goals has been to lower energy costs for public institutions and schools specifically, and specifically schools that have been affected by consolidation plans. Um, so lowering economic costs clearly is a driver here. Uh, I think there's been some, there's some conversation around providing renewable energy to public institutions, allowing them to take advantage of net metering and have renewable energy either on their roofs or um, located elsewhere. There could be trade-offs between these goals, right, um, to the extent that, for instance, if the actual driver is for the schools, Schools that are motivated by actually consuming renewable energy um, would, in order to make that claim, need to retain their recs uh, rather than transfer them to the utility. That would affect their compensation. They would be compensated at a lower rate under net metering. So hence, the goal of providing lower costs to schools is in conflict under net metering with um, providing renewable energy. So there are potentially trade-offs that I think need to be highlighted. and. Um, also, yeah. these goals can be met through other mechanisms other than net metering. So can you more? expand on that? Yeah. Expand on that. Sure. That these goals can be met through other, yeah, yeah. and I do have um, kind of a slide on alternatives to net metering, but it really gets at, again, what the customer motivation is. So is the, is the customer um, motivation to say, I am 100% renewable, I am generating renewable energy and consuming renewable energy. That claim can't be made by most net metering customers under the current rule. The vast majority of net metering customers transfer their recs to their utility, which means they give up that claim. So, so let's assume that the, uh, the real goal of the school district is to reduce their costs. Mm -hmm. So what, what are alternative means to net metering would you suggest for that? Well, I think that um, you could direct utilities to offer preferential rates to public institutions if you want it. I mean, if it's really about getting money into the hands of schools, there are a variety of ways you could do that. Right? If it's really about writing a check, if, if, if it's the economic bottom line that is the driver, uh, well, we with, could, for instance... With respect to renewable energy. So a, a school may want to do net metering because they both want to uh, lower their energy costs and uh, have greener electric uh, generation. Yeah, and I think that the point is net metering, when you transfer the RECs to the utility, it becomes a slice of their power supply portfolio. Right. So the customer, the school really can't, any, any renewable project that the utility has in its portfolio is furthering that goal of having all customers, not just the school. Right. <laughs> so net metering doesn't get you to having both lower costs and renewable energy as a school. You're well, I don't see that as a conflict, but I mean, if you're putting up solar 
and you're generating electricity, even if you give the recs to the utility, you're still doing your part for renewable energy. And I, I don't, uh, some people may see a conflict in that, but I, I, I don't. Yeah. And I give my recs to, and my solar panel to the utility, but I still consider the fact that I'm generating renewable energy. Double counting, Mike. <laughs> that's, 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 I don't really care. Don't care. Nobody else does either. I think there's been some federal movement on that and what kind of claims you can make. I think the Federal Trade Commission weighed in on that. Um, well, it's not like I'm getting any money for double counting. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I think my point being that once you transfer your RECs, your net metering just becomes a slice, and I'm sorry that I took out my power supply portfolio slice. It's just like any other renewable generator showing up in the utilities portfolio. And so the question I think that the utilities are raising is, is it justified, justifiable, does it make sense to pay that much more for net metering generation when the, when the end effect is the same? The same effect is that um, all of the utilities will have, you know, started in 2017, 1% of in-state generation in their power supply portfolios. And by 2032, they will have 10% under the RES. Um, if, should the legislature decide those are not sufficient levels, the RES would be the place to make that change. To the extent there's more renewable deployment in Vermont, those RECs would be sold out of state, or they would be saved for future use for meeting Tier 2 or Tier 3 of the RES. Increasing net metering just means you'll decrease other renewable generation projects in the state. Because you're looking at that as don't produce any more renewable energy than that. So if we have more net metering as part of that, you are automatically going to constrain other renewable exactly. uh, development you're going to do. Exactly, because that's the directive we've received from right. the legislature and the PUC. And Is that 10% uh, ceiling? Is, is the cap, and we're bound by least cost integrated planning and delivering meeting state goals at the lowest cost to ratepayers. Well, that, that raises another question. Yeah, I know, which we're not going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to touch on benefits and costs of net metering and then t talk briefly about some alternatives, which we've already started doing. Um, benefits of net metering, especially traditional rooftop net metering, can lead to generation sited close to load, and as we talked about, that can um, help alleviate strains on the distribution system. Uh, not generally the case with large 150 to 500 kW site um, projects. Those are not typically located close to load, so they can strain the distribution system. Uh, it allows customers to self-generate for to the extent that that's a driver for customers um, wanting to say I have panels on my roof and I'm producing my own electricity. Um, there's clearly a financial benefit to the developer and the participating customer. Net metering traditionally has been fairly lucrative. Um, there's economic development. There are job benefits through um, having a robust solar industry in Vermont. But again, res will ultimately dictate how much renewable generation is developed in Vermont. Um, so we can't say as a unique benefit of net metering that there is more renewable generation. Uh, drawbacks, again, <coughs> related to siting. Larger projects typically are located remote from the load that they serve, and therefore that P&D benefit is eliminated. And we can actually see the opposite effect, where there's a strain on the distribution system, <coughs> because these the distribution infrastructure doesn't tend to be as robust um, in the rural areas where we're seeing large projects deployed. Uh, there are significant, there have been in, continue to be significant cost shifts under the current rate structure. It's not sustainable to pay above retail rates. Um, taken to an extreme, if all customers decided to net meter, um, the only revenue that utilities, especially nonprofit utilities, get is through retail rates. And to the extent that we are required to pay out ho rates higher than retail, the program would essentially collapse on itself. It's not sustainable. And one of the charges with the PUC was to ensure that anyone who wants to net meter can. Um, so we don't think that that can be met if you're paying out above retail rate. There would literally be nowhere else to get that uh, revenue to pay customers. Um, and I think this is getting to some of what the committee is particularly interested in. Net metering is the most expensive way to meet the state's goals. Um, the current net metering rates for, um, that will be in effect, I think, until July are 14 to 18 cents a kilowatt hour. This is inclusive <coughs> of the REC. Um, 
in all of these prices, I'm going to include the value of the REC to make sure it's an apples to apples comparison. Standard offer projects, which also provide RECs to utilities, are developed in the range of 9 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and utility projects are being developed for slightly less than standard offer projects right now. And while um, net metering is often cited as having an economic development benefit related to solar jobs, um, there's also an economic development cost um, to the extent there's rate pressure and increased rates for all customers. And again, customers that transfer their RECs um, in order to get additional financial benefit then lose the ability to claim renewability. So these are the compensation rates. Um, this is from the PUC's most recent rate order. Under the current program, they update net metering rates every two years. Um, as you see, they, the PUC has decided that it's appropriate to ratchet down um, net metering compensation over time. I think that's been a measured uh, ratchet um, so as not to create a shock to the industry. Uh, and these just get to the different size projects and how they are cited. Um, and the value of net metering generation is estimated at 9 to 10 cents. So as you, and that's the value to the utility and other rate payers. So um, if a school is currently net metering, where would they show up on this chart? So Bedford is, is looking at um, putting in more net metering. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that they have, I'm not sure how big their field is, but it's certainly not uh, in category one. Uh, mm -hmm. It is likely in uh, category three. So if they expanded that this year, they would be getting 14.4 cents a kilowatt hour. That, am I reading that correctly? If there was a new project bill in 2019 that was on a preferred site and larger than 150 kW, they would be getting 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. Assuming they transferred the rec to the utility. Right. If they didn't, they would get three cents lower than that. Uh, so they'd only be getting 11.4. 11 11 um, but if so, if they do transfer the rec, they would get 14.4. Yes. And I had to repeat myself. I had the same question that I had earlier to um, Andrea, which is what the utility does with that rec. And it has mm -hmm. to be retired, presumably. Mm -hmm. you know, then does that allow other RECs in your portfolio to be sold? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the fungibility of the REC sure. and kind of what the net cost is to the utility for yep. purchasing that power. Yeah, so um, net metering RECs do have to be retired and applied against the Renewable Energy Standard um, requirements by statute. So yep. utilities don't have a choice about selling those. You're yep. right, to the extent that we have excess net metering RECs, we could sell standard offer RECs or other RECs. Um, I mean, there was a, I think there was a question about pricing. Right now we're seeing fairly low REC prices, um, 10 to $20 a megawatt hour, um, one to two cents a kilowatt hour, so one to two cents of this compensation. Um, that is, so that's included in the value to ratepayers of net meter generation. So the REC would be one to two cents and the other benefits, the energy and the capacity. That's all baked into the value. It's baked in, so it's baked in on the cost and the benefits side. Yeah. So you're actually paying more than 14.4 cents uh, because you're you netting out the value of the rec that you can sell. We're paying 14.4 cents for an entire package of renewable energy, energy capacity, um, and renewability. The actual market value of that package is 9 to 10 cents. Four and a half cents is a premium that we're paying. Okay, I want to dig into this more. We don't have time to get it now. Just clar clarifications. Mm -hmm. This is this is what you're paying to the customer. Yes. These these rates. Yeah. Right. Um, and is this different from how it uh, how it used to be with a, with a with a, a six cent a six cent adder and the and then the decreasing adder over the, over the years? Or uh, what I'm asking is was was the what was in in the requirements, was it a certain cent adder, or was it a, a fixed rate that the utilities are, are are paying to customers? Under the previous net metering rule, is that what you're asking? Well, is that was is that what's evolved? I guess is what I'm asking. It used to be an adder, and now it's a and now it's a fixed rate. So it's a it's a rate um, different differentiation by size, which we didn't oh, yeah, previously yeah. No, have. Right, right. So it's a rate, and there is an adjuster for the rec. And 
Okay, but but the so I bought into a community solar field. Mm -hmm. I don't know, three or four four years ago or something. At, just before the uh, the adder, the amount of the adder went down. So I, I have a six cents adder. I'm, I'm I'm getting paid retail plus six cents for every kilowatt hour that gets generated. Now I'm not getting a flat rate. I'm getting for, I'm getting years. for, for ten years. Ten, ten years. Yeah. What's fixed is the is the adder, not the not the rate. Is what I'm. So I'm, saying. So I, I'm yep. just trying to clarify um, whether that setup has changed. That structure did change with the 2017 net metering rule. Okay. So now there's a fixed, there are fixed rates that get adjusted each year. There's a, no, I'm sorry. So these are locked for your contract term. Right, right. But, 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 the, but the, the, the amount, the, the rate that's locked for 10 years changes every year as, as, as you're showing here. Yes, for projects that come online, any project yes. that comes online in a given year is That's locked right. into that rate for ten years. For ten, for yeah. ten years, yep. And then the okay, adjuster I'm not, changes. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking. I'm not saying what I'm trying to ask very well. Isn't it the case that the rate itself may go up and down, but the adder stays the same for the ten years? That's what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> so, so if, if the current rate per kilowatt hour, if you're net metering, and the current rate per kilowatt hour is fourteen and a half cents then every kilowatt hour of electricity you get is, is getting that 14 and a half cents as you even out your, and because it's, you're not getting that electricity from the grid. But the, you, you're getting paid for all the electricity you generate, even if you don't use it, at the rate of the adder. So, so you're getting paid retail plus an amount. Yes. Whatever retail is in 20 in 2021, I'll get paid. I'll get paid retail plus six cents. Yes. And is it, is it the same uh, currently? Is that is that is that what, uh, or 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 are you are people who get enter into a contract it's now still getting the, paid still the same rate? equation? It's still the same equation. Okay. Well, so these are based on current retail yeah. rates. Then it depends on how much you get as an adder for the first ten years is based on when you had your system installed. Yes. Yes, that's right. And I do, and I believe that the retail rate can change every two years if you see um, revisits a statewide average retail rate. So yes, and I believe that that can float over the life of the contract. Sorry, I was having a hard time understanding your question. I, I didn't articulate all that. I did, but so anyway, these rates that you have on your table here are uh, based on current rates. Uh, current, the current, you have current rate retail. They came out several months ago for yeah. 2018 that will be in effect for two yeah, years. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, I was so confused. Just about how I asked that. Um, the, the value figure, nine to ten cents, mm -hmm. um, is that the PUC calculated? Um, that's what? utility calculations for market values of energy capacity, also any avoided transmission and distribution upgrades, and the value of a RAC renewable credit. And that's pretty consistent across utilities. I know. You all heard some testimony um, earlier, I think last week, about a report that Synapse did um, valuing solar at, I think, significantly higher than that. Um, the PUC in its analysis squarely rejected the Synapse analysis. There were several um, several flaws. The Synapse analysis excluded value values and costs of RECs, essentially. It just said they didn't have good projections, so they didn't include it. That's clearly an area that's applicable and also volatile also extremely relevant to the analysis. Um, they also um, had a substantial credit for transmission and distribution deferral. Um, that's an area that now that we've seen the peak go past sundown, additional solar capacity really does not have a benefit of deferring transmission and distribution um, upgrades today. today because your peak is no longer occurring when solar generation is occurring. So those are just some concerns we had with that methodology. and. and just, I want to speak to what the difference between um, the value numbers that you're seeing from different sources might be. And Synapse is going to be here on Friday to talk about that report. Um, I'd like to give you time to finish your presentation. Um, yeah, since I will be think here. I'm pretty close. Yep, yeah, sorry. Um, so again, as you know, VEPSA, we sit in um, a unique situation because we are municipals and could potentially be uh, affected by this public institutions. Um, provision that's contemplated under H-423, as well as utilities. Um, this just speaks to the cost shifting. Um, we've done this analysis for several of our members because several of our member utilities um, are within municipalities that have contemplated net metering themselves. 
and many of them have decided once they learned about the impact on the utility itself and other ratepayers, they decided not to go down the net metering road um, because essentially there was going to be a benefit to the municipality of net metering um, through lower energy costs, but the utility would then incur additional costs um, from those projects. So upward rate pressure, um, you have heard this, and I think similar to VEC, we've done everything we can to avoid having rate impacts, found efficiencies, found operational efficiencies. We've also um, been in a period of fairly low power, um, power purchasing costs, but the economic effects of net metering um, do put upward pressure on rates. And depending on the size of the system, again, we have fairly small utility members. Um, that's one to three percent um, rate impact. And these 500 kW projects specifically, which are the biggest cost drivers, um, do have a substantial above market cost. And again, when I say above market cost, I'm talking about as compared to other renewables. I'm not talking about as compared to um, system power, <coughs> renewable power. Just for your first bullet point, that's a historic um, observation that in, uh, in, in the I don't know, past three or four years, you've seen that, that um, 500 kW um, net metering projects have increased your rates one to three percent depending on the so these projects did not go forward so um, when we did the financial analysis and provided that I believe that was in the Swanton context to the municipality the municipality decided not to move forward with net metering Swanton actually is in the situation of being hundred percent renewable um, and when the util electric utility manager communicated with others in the municipal government about the cost shifts that occur, they decided not to go forward with net metering. Yeah. So we have not, they did not have a, a rate impact. Yeah, this is the town. This town is the town, yeah. Um, I think I only, oh good, only a couple more slides. Um, again, alternatives to net metering. Um, again, it gets at what is the motivation, if the customer's motivation is truly to be 100% renewable or to be a portion renewable. Uh, some utilities have green purchasing programs. I buy a portion of my power from Greener Mountain Power, where I pay more to consume renewable energy. Um, renewable energy credit purchases, anyone can purchase RECs. A REC is, entitles you to claim that you are consuming renewable energy. Um, currently, we are seeing fairly low REC prices, I think I said, in the $10 to $20 um, a megawatt hour range. So again, this is for customers or institutions specifically that want to say, I am a 100% renewable uh, institution. Also, community solar tariffs. Hyde Park has developed one for their um, community solar project. Hardwick is in the process of doing that. This would be similar to the VEC model that you heard earlier, um, where the utility as PPA for renewable energy and customers can buy into that. Um, in terms of uh, just increasing, rather than having customers claim renewability, increasing overall um, renewability in Vermont, power purchase agreements, utility-owned projects, and I should have included standard offer on here. Those are all alternatives that provide the exact same benefits as net metering at a lower cost. And this, the last two are just a couple of um, slides on, on VEPSA's solar development. Um, in our various territories, we're actively pursuing solar with Encore um, Renewable and planning to deploy five to 10 megawatts in total. Those would be power purchase agreements. And again, the, that renewable power would go into our um, power supply portfolio and benefit all customers and be delivered at um, rates that are in the 10, nine to 10 cent range. BEPS is also actively participating in the standard offer. Um, there's a provision within standard offer for utilities to own projects, and we have developed several projects through the standard offer. This is a picture of the Lindenville project that was developed on a brownfield under the standard offer program. Are you guys supportive of a continuation of standard offer, or is that something that Standard offer has some separate implementation issues. Our biggest concern around standard offer is um, wheeling charges, which I think you did hear testimony on, that there are these transfer payments among utilities that have posted a disproportionate amount of renewable energy, specifically VEC in the Shiai area. So um, I think that that is another way that ratepayers are incurring additional costs that aren't necessary. Um, I think standard offer is a preferable mechanism to net metering because it leverages the competitive mechanism. Standard offer went from being a fixed price contract similar to net metering. Um, 
several years ago, I think now it was 2013, to a competitive um, bid mechanism, which drove prices down almost overnight. So to the extent that it's competitive, we prefer it to net metering. Um, but I think the other implementation issues around wheeling are problematic. And again, um, the RES dictates how much renewable energy utilities are going to procure. So if we weren't getting standard offer power, we would be going out to bid and having developers come to us with projects and potentially leveraging the lowest cost for rate payers. So why would uh, UNIS uh, develop a project using standard offer instead of just developing a project? So part of that is um, this, this issue of wheeling. So if, if you don't have, so the way standard offer works is everybody gets right. their percentage share. Right. And if you don't have your percentage share in the ground of standard offer generation, you get charged uh -huh. by other utilities to transmit power. So we're paying Vermont Electric Co-op because they're hosting all of the standard offer power. So there's a benefit to the BEPSA members to having um, projects located within our service territory. And I think standard offer, I think Vermont's renewable goals do contemplate um, distributing renewable generation around the state rather than having it concentrated. So, so that was part of the design of standard offer, not, not, a, not an oversight? I think it, that's part of the goal, yeah. although this wheeling, yes, yeah. Yeah. part of the design. For things like loan charges, it's, it's, uh, VEPs are treated as one entity, or are each of your members treated VEPs separately? is treated as one entity, and we disaggregate costs among our members. So last question, Seth. You mentioned uh, the, the, the peak shifted to the evening. Mm -hmm. Is the, the new peak in the evening higher or lower than the old peak that was during daylight hours? Um, we are at a lower peak than Vermont's historic peak now. I think we saw. I think peaks peaks peaked in the early 2000s, <laughs> and we've seen overall load decline. And the peak now that's occurring, I think between seven and nine at night, is lower than historic peaks. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Years ago, um, when I spent more time in the building, um, we really operate from the belief that everyone. Um, has the right to a healthy environment, and that clean energy is a big part of that, a big part of where it starts. Really quickly, Sun Common at a glance. Um, I mentioned we were founded in uh, 2012. Um, we are a chartered benefit corporation. That's how we are chartered with the state. We are a certified B Corp. Um, it just means that we um, try and use our business as a force for good and are legally required to try and do so. Um, we are majority owned by our founders and some um, institutions here in Vermont, like the Vermont Community Loan Fund or Community Foundation and Fresh Tracks Capital. Um, we are Vermont's largest clean energy business um, by employment. <laughs> Um, there are others that install more kind of megawatts out there, um, but um, when we look at you know the impact of our employment, um, we're the largest residential company, and we've um, helped around 5,000 Vermont homes go solar over the past seven years. Um, 8,000 total customers, uh, 3,000 of those are over in New York State. We've expanded beyond Vermont's footprint um, over the last couple of years. Um, we have 122 full-time staff here in Vermont. We're hiring more um, to serve our growth um, in New York. Uh, we have a young workforce, um, so we had the pleasure of having the governor come visit us at our office the other day, and he shared that the, I think it was the average age of a tradesperson in Vermont was 58 years old. Uh, nearly felt 58. Yeah. Um, and the average age in our office is 32. Um, it's a fun place that draws people. People want to work there. These are jobs that are bringing people back to Vermont or keeping them here, um, which we like. Um, Eight million roughly in total annual compensation. Um, 220 Vermont employees and family members providing full benefits um, for our staff. Um, over the seven years, we've done some um, innovative uh, approaches to try and accelerate the market and um, adoption of solar, um, offering consumer financing, most of that through the Vermont State Employees Credit Union. Um, and we actually helped them 
um, in their process to expand their charter so that they can offer loans um, and bring in capital from other states around the region. So we actually work with the Vermont State Employees Credit Union, VSCCU, over in New York. Um, uh, community solar, we, about a thousand of those Vermont households are folks that signed up with community solar. Um, that program stopped for us uh, and pretty much stopped across the board in um, after the changes to net metering and the permitting rules in two, uh, 2017. When I, s I should clarify, when I speak about community solar, um, our focus is helping households that couldn't go solar or businesses that couldn't go solar on their own to participate in a community array. That is a slightly different flavor than signing up institutional organizations, municipalities, or large companies to take large chunks. Our focus was on helping community, uh, individual residences, for the most part, access um, community solar. Can I ask a question? Sure. Are you familiar with VECs? We just heard testimony about their community solar program. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Can you tell me the difference between yours and theirs in um, terms of benefit to the resident? Yeah. So I haven't looked at theirs. And accessibility, actually, right. to the resident. I haven't looked at theirs in a um, little while, and probably a couple of years, because they started a number of years ago. Um, in part, uh, we looked at that, and we looked at the VEC market and said, this is a challenging place for us to want to expand our business and deploy community solar because we'd be in direct competition with the utility who has a monopoly access to a customer base. Um, and frankly, it was that one was a pilot granted, um, uh, originally proposed in this committee, and we think that that poses some challenges if we want a competitive market. So we have done little to no community solar in VEC, in part because the utility which is a monopoly, has uh, access to that customer base. So just to follow up on that, um, I'm hearing, so, okay. You're, I'm hearing you reference them as a monopoly, which they are, because they're a regulated utility. Right. And they are required to keep the lights on. Yes. Do you have a similar requirement as part of your community solar? I mean, are there regulations um, on your projects like that? Yeah, our projects, all of our projects go through the same permitting process effectively that their community solar project went through at the Public Utility Commission and have the same requirements. Um, okay. I, don't, I uh, don't mean, I'm not trying to disparage the fact no, that I they're monopoly. I think, I think that they are, they serve a fantastic purpose yeah. and um, I, you know, we have states that have monopoly utilities and states that don't, and I actually think that the monopoly structure is a pretty good one and efficient in that marketplace. It's I'm just trying to clarify, we don't have a solar community solar offering in Vermont Electric Co-op's territory, in part because we actually had customers, we had some early projects, we had customers call the utility and say, how should I be thinking about community solar, and they were told, oh, don't do theirs, do ours. And that um, experience um, soured us in part. So can I just add another clarifying question? So out of VEC territory, I mean, yes. presumably all the other utilities also have, I mean, a, a monopoly, they're regulated yes. utilities. So I'm not maybe following you on why it's better to do it in other companies, which is not what my original question was. Yeah. It was more just trying to understand if you are offering an, a better access for residential. Gotcha. But maybe this is something to follow up with. I'm happy to. Um, okay. I think, yeah, we could probably do a longer conversation. Okay. Great. So one distinction in answer to your question is that this is net metering uh, that you're talking about, right? Uh, community, yep. community solar is net metered. Yep. Whereas VEX, VECs uh, is uh, uh, it's power purchase agreement type thing. Right. So right. And so I think my question. They're getting the net metering rates in with the BEC territory, yeah. but they are with this. My question was around access to resident because he was talking about the ease of um, 
access to residential customers, I think. Yeah. And so I was trying to understand the difference in this project as opposed to the one that we had heard about from the VEC. Right. That was my original question. Yeah. Isn't the difference that VEC um, was interested and in, decided to build their own effect and affect their own communities, or isn't that the difference? I mean, the question may be being overcomplicated yeah. that I can't. It was yeah. really about, you know, if I am, a, you know, an average Vermonter <laughs> in VEC territory, or apparently you're not in VEC territory, you know, we're in a different territory. Trying to you know, access this community solar, what is the difference for me in terms of because average Vermonters are not thinking a lot about this, right? So, yeah. am I getting more technical assistance? Is it costing me more? Am I getting better benefits? So, it's just trying to get a sense of yep. if we have comparable even products. Right. Um, I probably just put it in a nutshell. When we did one community solar project in VEC territory probably three years ago, it um, it was the earliest days of their community solar project, and it was a comparable proposition, kind of value proposition to the homeowner. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I probably just should right. have gone there. That's all right. Um, we do primarily focus on residential customers uh, and or businesses. So our focus is on kind of home, business, and community-based energy. Um, we haven't been in the development space doing the 500s or the, um, that we are fully supportive of that being part of our energy mix. It's just not been the space that we've been participating in. Um, we do offer solar home heating and cooling to um, um, probably a quarter of our customers also choose to um, install air source heat pumps um, when they go solar, um, reducing usually oil or propane usage. Uh, we have developed a smaller residential solar canopy. Uh, we offer home storage, um, the Tesla Powerwall um, primarily. Um, and uh, we've started to install um, electric vehicle charging stations for folks as well. Um, and the segue being to the first commercial scale solar parking canopy was installed in Representative's hometown uh, in uh, Stowe. And that's what I was going to mostly talk about um, uh, today. Yeah, um, the um, electric vehicle charging stations. So, who owns those? Well, you, you said you installed them, but, but yep. who's the owner of them? Um, almost all of the ones that have been um, that we've installed are like home charging stations or oh, level two at a business stations. where the homeowner owns. The station or the business oh, okay. so owns the like station. A residential, not a residential not a or um, or at businesses. You know, they want to install for their customers or for their employees. We've done some of those. Something as well. we would drive up to and plug in. Yep. In the parking lot or something like yep. that. Yep. It's like a Vermont teddy bear or something like that. Right. Yep. It's a tangent uh, that I'm happy to again probably talk about in the hallway if you're interested. We did apply for some of the VW money. And we are, and we uh, were selected in the first round of those grants, and we intend to be um, installing a, a fast charger um, up in South Burlington um, that we'll own. Um, and part of it goes back to our mission of trying to drive the adoption of clean energy technologies faster across the board. Um, so, um, why on earth do solar parking canopies? These are the hardest solar to build, hands down. You've got massive foundations that go into the ground 14 feet down. You've got a, you're erecting a brand new significant steel structure and then putting the solar on top. The solar is probably the easiest part. It's a you know civil engineering project. Um, and the reason that we do that is because um, to align with our company's mission, we really want to utilize the built environment. Um, when we look at climate change, the amount of change that we need to see in our energy <coughs> economy in a very short period of time, we can't leave our built environment out of that and just do it elsewhere. Um, so we need to be utilizing the built environment that we have here. That's why we focus on rooftops. That's why we focus on um, trying to make these parking canopies, canopies work. Um, um, 
Uh, Melissa Bailey was in the chair before and mentioning that you know you get slightly less benefit from a project um, that's not that's a little bit farther from load. These parking canopies are always almost by definition near load, near usage. They are, you know, at the alchemist to the power is getting used um, right there on site almost all the time, probably all the time. There's probably very little that actually flows off site there. Um, so and that makes for a stronger grid. It also means that it's slightly more valuable um, to uh, the electric grid. We also wanted to put a value on it is a visible solution to our climate crisis. Um, and again, we fully support larger scale solar, which is usually out of sight. But when it's out of sight, it's often out of mind. And uh, we want to help drive the public awareness around these solutions, provide some hope and inspiration, and ideally uh, faster adoption of climate solutions. Uh, and then the final link was that we want um, to physically link clean electricity with clean transportation. So we have one parking canopy in the permit process right now, um, front of the Public Utility Commission. Um, and I think with that one, we're going to be installing 24 electric vehicle charging stations, um, uh, serving more than half of the covered parking spaces. Um, so it really does help make that uh, connection for hooks, which we believe is valuable in terms of accelerating adoption of electric vehicles. Is that right, right here in Montpelier? No, that one happens to be in Colchester. Oh, Colchester. Um, so uh, this is a view, there's actually, you can see there's another half of the array over here on the far side of the parking lot. Um, but this is the Alchemist Brewery, that's uh, Amber. She was our commercial project manager on the project, uh, construction manager, um, and gives you a sense of what we're talking about um, and the scale. This project was 110 kW AC, uh, 110 or 120 kW AC. So um, when you um, think about these parking canopies, you actually start to get a fair amount of solar generation in a concentrated way. I heard uh, testimony, somebody saying, you know, a 500 kW parking canopy would take up three to four acres. It, it's nowhere near that because it's way more concentrated than when it's out in a field and you're talking about racks. On racks and in row spacing and shading from trees, uh, it's a fairly efficient way, space-wise, um, to deploy solar. What? This is, this is irrelevant, Art. But why is that uh, more to one side of the parking area than the, than the other? Um, so they had this um, kind of island in the middle. Huh. Um, and frankly, it's just customer aesthetic desires. <laughs> um, we would have been happy to cover more parking spaces. Uh, they liked the look of this better. Um, it is nice because the snow basically, um, to the extent this is in Stowe, so this was designed to the highest snow load capacity that we have in the state of Vermont. Um, and you know, it drops there at the drip edge um, and or, um, and you know, so that also meant that they didn't have to, in dealing with their snow management in the parking lot, it was easier too. But the other one is slightly wider. Um, is um, so I want to touch briefly. There are three permits. Um, your legislation um, that's being considered obviously addresses um, the CPG, the Certificate of Public Good portion. But I did want to share that we also get uh, file electrical work notices with the state um, and building permits. So these are treated as new buildings as far as the state is concerned. There was some, I think there was a question in the committee um, on another day about, well gosh, what about, are these being designed and built safely? We have a separate permitting process for that and we absolutely get them, you know, structurally engineered, PE stamp, reviewed, inspected um, by a separate permit process. 
Is that a mandatory process or is that voluntary that your company elects to take on? Yeah, it's mandatory. Yeah. And if it wasn't, <laughs> but yeah, it's mandatory. <laughs> Did you, um, what uh, kind of approval did you get from the town? Um, we worked, we reached out to the town, I think select board and planning board, I'm not sure. We got a letter of support ahead of time from the town, so we let them know about it. We shared what the plan was um, and um, asked if they'd be willing to write a letter of support. We didn't have to. That wasn't like required. A letter of support to whom? Uh, in support of the project to the PUC. To the PUC. Saying. But you didn't have to go to the town. You didn't have to get their approval. Um. In general, what's the what's the role of municipalities? Yeah. So, in the current permitting process, we absolutely. So there's a before we're even allowed to file our permit. Uh, there's a 45 day period where we send our idea, our rough draft permit application, um, basically to the town and to a number of state agencies. And we didn't want the town to be surprised by that, we, so we reached out prior to the 45 day even to let them know this is what it is, did they have any concerns. Um, Right. Yeah. There's no asking, jurisdiction. Exactly. Yeah. What, does the town have any jurisdiction over this? Um, the jurisdiction lies on the siting side. Our belief is that the jurisdiction lies on the siting side with the PUC. The town is granted party status in that process at the PUC. So if they had an issue, an objection, they would be able to raise their hand and um, weigh in at the PUC, and they have automatic party status there. So um, one of the questions that came up uh, in PUC testimony last week, I believe, uh, was should the PUC have jurisdiction over the structure itself or just the uh, solar part of it? In other words, if if uh, somebody wanted to put up a parking lot canopy with solar on it, should they go to the town first to make sure that they get the proper permits for building the structure? And then, once they get those permits, then go to the Public Utility Commission for the CPG to install solar on that structure? Gosh, I hope not. The, the amount of time, the extra time. So I actually well, think that the um, PUC is uh, a body that's well um, suited to address the siting of electric generation facilities. And that's effectively what it is. I think it's important that folks who um, need to have a say and an opportunity in that process. And I think the PUC does a good job on that. Um, and I think that, um, I believe that when it came up the other day, I listened to the tape on some of that testimony, it wasn't clear that there were these other existing permit processes, processes that determine, you know, is it a safe building, is it electrically sound, that also run um, after we get the certificate of public good, then we also have to go through these, uh, the other state processes. Um, so I actually think it can work well, um, how it is. For clarification, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the state differentiates between a parking structure and a structure that was whose primary purpose is not to support solar panels. Is that correct? Yeah. It's um, it, so prior to the 2017 rule change, um, all of the rules and regulations were written with rooftop or ground mount solar in mind. And I think that's why we're in this middle ground, um, because um, the utility commission in part said, look, there are no parking canopies effectively, no commercial parking canopies in our state. Like, this, this isn't working as an avenue. If we want any of that, then obviously something needs to change. And I would highlight that over the two plus years 
since that change that specifically called out parking, solar parking canopies. We've had two. <laughs> so it's still not, uh, it's still not exactly a robust marketplace. Um, um, and if we want the solar in the built environment over um, impervious parking lots, uh, whether they be asphalt or gravel or, you know, Sherpak or whatever, then um, the, I think we need to consider some changes. Um, and I think there are some changes, I can get into some of those uh, that will ideally make these more viable projects. Are, are uh, parking lot canopies um, economically viable? Are they, uh, are they money losers? Are they uh, um, for the developer? So I think uh, when you're asking that um, for the developer, we don't do that kind of project development here in Vermont, where it's a third party. So there's a middle entity that's looking to play matchmaker, build a project, find somebody else who's going to you know contract for the power. So these the parking canopies that we've considered are um, direct sale to the business. Um, um, so there's no kind of middle developer there. And from the business perspective, I think there are, there's no doubt they're more expensive. Like that's you're building a significant structure that you don't have to do if you're just in a field. Um, and you don't have to do if you're on a roof. Um, so if the compensation is the same <coughs> as a roof, the money is going to flow from those developers to developing roofs. Or if it's cheaper to put a, park or a solar project in a field than it is in a parking lot from an economic standpoint, the developers are going to develop the fields. Um, and that's largely what we've been seeing. I think the parking canopies that we've looked at, the customer has had um, more than just a pure economic focus. So the alchemist wants to um, generate more power on site through clean resources. That was a big part of that for them. They wanted to show that and represent that. They didn't want to put it on their brand new roof that um, you know wasn't perfect for it. Um, and um, it was a, is it a good financial decision? They believe yes. I believe yes. Although the payback is much longer on a parking canopy structure than it is on a rooftop project or a green field. Why? Um, because it's more expensive to build. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of steel. It's a custom job um, to tailor to every parking lot. And then you've got, rather than poking holes in the ground with the metal posts in a field, you've got a 12 to 14 foot, three foot round foundation that requires, um, that's the drill bit. Um, you know, it's just a different project. And it's that deep because it's because of compaction from cars driving in the parking lot? Why is it so deep? Because um, you've got to hold up a big sail oh. and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a median price range for a um, square foot of rooftop, uh, green field, or parking lot that you can share? That's a great question. Um, it probably range. So if I were to take a 200, a 200 kW rooftop, or 150 um, AC rooftop, um, you're probably talking about a price premium of 25% for a parking canopy. Okay. And compared to I doing it in a field? Uh, is that more or less expensive than a rooftop? Um, the fields generally are um, even less um, because you get a lot, or it's a, it's a different economic value proposition because you get more generation out of a field. You know, your panels are tilted perfectly south at 30 degrees rather than on a flat roof at five degrees. Um, 
so the value proposition for fields is probably the highest. That's why when you know the utilities are looking to develop solar projects, they're looking to go as big as they can in a field somewhere because that's the cheapest. But it's also there are other trade-offs there, um, and this is kind of on the other end of it's right in the built environment. You can still get some scale. It's building a lasting infrastructure. Um, it's different, and I think we need probably D, all of the above, from a climate perspective. Um, so uh, an interesting note that. Um, it's a DEC in New York. Um, I actually just classified the parking canopy structures in New York State as non environmental, uh, classified them as having no environmental impact, so basically outside of their regulatory purview. So they basically just said, look, we don't want to be bothered with looking at environmental impact of a parking canopy. Um, and they classified that across the state as a means of um, their. Uh, Green New Deal. Um, and here in Vermont, because the parking canopies are treated like a ground mount, we talk with our friends at ANR about wetlands. When we're installing a parking lot canopy in a parking lot, we talk to the Agency of Agriculture about prime ag soils when we're installing in a parking lot. Um, stormwater issues when we're installing over previously classified um, impervious surface. Um, aesthetics, like if it's a parking lot canopy over a parking lot, it seems like an incredibly appropriate place uh, or thing to have there. Um, we also notify all of the abutters. So if it's a large commercial parcel, that could be a lot of individuals that might not be actually anywhere near the actual array as well as the um, various municipal and town committees. Um, I will say that uh, our first uh, foray into this permitting was the Alchemist, and it was great working with our state agencies. They were fabulous, but it adds time, and it adds money, and frankly, they're really busy doing other really important work. Um, I'd also say um, the Coming, the permit coming through the Public Utility Commission was quick. The Public Utility Commission reviewed it, turned it around pretty quickly, um, and so it's not that you know we have egregious complaints about those agencies or the PUC. It's more that 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 it adds fifteen to thirty thousand dollars of extra cost that we believe is completely unnecessary. What was PHP? Oh, the Department of Historic Preservation. We go there too. So, um, so just in terms of H three sixty six. Yep. Um, I guess I have two questions. Is there a specific portion of this bill that you would suggest um, we keep and or? Uh, is it not in this bill what you're asking us to do? Um, do you have a suggestion for us? I think we're on the right slide. All right. Um, so um, in terms of our recommendation, we appreciate the direction that you all are contemplating in this bill, which is basically to ask the Public Utility Commission to establish a registration project process similar to that of you know a roof mount or a really, a really small solar project. So that's at the beginning of, um, yep, right at the beginning of the bill. Um, and um, I do think um, this speaks a little bit to Representative um, Sharon's uh, questions. I do think that there's an important role to um, allow municipalities also to see what's happening, raise their hand if they've got questions. Um, so the, our recommendation would be that the legislature ask the um, PUC to create a registration process that's substantially the same as a roof mount, except let's make sure that our municipal bodies still get the notification and the party status to participate if they want to. Um, because these are different, you know, if it's up on a roof, there's really, 
just like zero view or impact in a community. These are at least going to be visible. Um, and to the extent that we can make sure that they're included, uh, we believe that would be a good thing. So, yeah. so I think this is uh, section one, two. Um, are you on the bill? Yep. And are you, is this a change to so, there? Um, this is a slight modification. Yep. Um, so I believe uh, what's in the bill has two challenges to it. Um, one is this just incredibly vague. In so this particular in, section. In that particular section yep. in this draft, yep. it basically says create a registration price. Yep. Yep. For any size. But there's no guidelines about what? what type of registration process. Should it be similar to a roof? Should it be totally different? Should it be five times longer than the current <laughs> permit process? So I think some additional guidance um, would be probably be appropriate um, if uh, the committee is moving in that direction. And the second piece is there is no um, uh, timeline. So it's asking the Public Utility Commission to create a registration process without guidance on when they should do that by. When they, uh, um, and, we and so the time frames are in a different section as well. Um, I believe <clears throat> it still is silent on when the Public Utility Commission would be asked to actually perform this work that you contemplate in Section 1. In terms of exactly how much time. So we've asked them, and this bill asks them to establish a timeline for priority projects yeah. and identifies canopies as one of those types, but it doesn't actually give us the time frame that you're asking for. Yeah, so I think um, two different things. Uh, that second section of the bill yeah. speaks to timelines for all these projects and how quickly the utility commission is supposed to turn them around and whatnot. I'm not speaking to that. I'm speaking to if section one of the bill asks the Public Utility Commission to create a registration process, when should they be done with that work? Are you asking them to be done with that in June or next June or December? Oh, it's in the creation of the process? That's right. I got you. Apologize. Lots that's of timelines right. in there. Um, and one of the challenges um, that I will share, and uh, we're very reluctant um, to do these projects, um, as excited as we are about them, in part because the way that um, we've perceived ground mounts to, be, um, to move forward at the Public Utility Commission is that if a neighbor raises their hand and say, I've got concerns. It automatically sends it into a hearing process, which we believe um, from our own experience and from what we've heard from others would double the permitting cost at least and probably the associated timeline. And these projects are so thin and on the margins already, and I, I don't know that I don't know if it was the intent of the Public Utility Commission or of this um, committee and your colleagues to allow somebody who doesn't like the look of a parking canopy over a parking lot to effectively kill the project, because that would kill the project. Um, so I think that's a real question of do you want neighbors to have that same ability regarding these projects as they currently have regarding some of the you know larger uh, greenfield projects. And that's a policy decision for you all to make. So just in terms of uh, understanding uh, the impacts, so if we were to change this, like what would be um, the primary benefit yeah. of changing this? Who, who would it be? What would it be? Yep. Uh, so I think there are uh, two main impacts. Um, one is on permit costs, um, so they would shrink, which would so that's a development drop cost. directly to the project costs. For us, it's just <coughs> here's the cost of what it takes for us to build the project, yeah. plus an operating margin, yeah. and so yeah. reducing the permitting cost benefits to you. Well, I actually I don't 
imagine that they'd be, we aren't going to do projects that we don't think are financially sound as a business. So what it changes is it makes more projects possibly financially sound, so we would potentially be able to do more than one every two years. <laughs> um, and that's, I think, what we want to see. Um, so it um, would reduce some of that. Frankly, it reduces a tiny bit of workload on some of the agencies. It's on the on the margin. I don't want to overplay that. Um, but they're uh, often overworked um, or have very full plates already. Um, and then I think the other thing that we would do is it would um, make these projects dramatically easier to stage and move through a development pipeline. Um, because right now we've got a 45 day, we've got a ton of work to do to prep for a 45 day notice, then you've got a 45 day notice, then you've got to prep the actual permit package, then you've got to submit the permit package and wait 30 days, and then you've got to wait. So it just condenses all of that and makes it less risky from our end and from the customer's end because we're not putting out a whole lot of development investment up front at risk in the projects because we have greater certainty that if that it will likely that it will actually get built. So less risky um, and easier to move more projects forward. Okay. In in going back to Laura's first question about who who the who benefits. Um, so what I didn't hear you say directly was that the client benefits because development costs are a pass through. Is that yeah, no, actually, I think, sorry, I wasn't clear. I think that is the direct benefit, is it would reduce the sell price, which would make it even more available to more people. It would make it an easier project, and it would reduce the sell price, which makes it, you know, we've had clearly the, just the economics for these projects, don't move them forward. We've had two in the state's history. You can look around to other states, they're um, much more common. Um, so how do we cut out all the costs that we can so that the existing compensation rates can make the projects work? The alternative is, if we, you want more, great, leave the exact process, but ask for an increase in compensation rates. I would rather see us go in the other direction. Um, can you say compensation, you mean, you mean incentives? Yes. Yeah. And that's what a lot of other states have done. They say, we want solar in these places. We want people to install it. We're going to put in a whole bunch of additional state money towards it. Um, we don't have those. I don't believe we have those resources. Any other questions for James? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. That's <laughs> My awkward <laughs> seating. Well, you should the see ice. The ice got me about four weeks ago, and I broke my kneecap. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. Don't you don't want to do it, it no. especially your driving leg when you live in Castleton, far away. Um. All right. Uh, so you see. can operate your uh, presentation right from that. Um, okay. Well, I have cheat sheet notes. Okay. All right. And if you could also, um, Leslie, identify yourself. Oh, I will do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Leslie Cadwell. Um, I'm not a paid lobbyist. Uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, I'm here um, because uh, I have a passion for getting stuff done. Um, in a way that um, uh, uh, satisfies um, the uh, uh, policy objectives that the legislature has uh, established um, in a cost-effective way and gives people an opportunity to participate and have a say in, in uh, what goes on around in their uh, communities. Um, uh, by way of background, some of you know me. Um, many of you do not. Um, I, just for some perspective, um, I have a unique 
history as an attorney here in Vermont. Um, I graduated uh, from Vermont Law School to become a Vermont lawyer. I clerked with Ernest uh, Gibson of the Vermont Supreme Court after law school. I uh, went for a short time into private practice and learned that insurance defense wasn't the reason that I wanted to practice law. So I took a job at the Department of Public Service where I served as special counsel. Um, that's the fancy name for a staff attorney um, at, the, uh, at the department. Um, I served at the department um, under three governors and three, Rich Sedano, Christine Salambier, and David O'Brien. Republicans and Democrats. I'm not a registered of any party. Um, I have served twice as uh, director for telecommunications for the Department of Public Service. I was the staff attorney uh, assigned. Um, for those of you who were here um, in 2006 and 2007, um, legislative session, I spent most of the legislative session here in the State House helping to usher the um, a bill that got um, uh, unanimous support on the floor to the est establish uh, permitting requirements for telecommunications facilities um, so the state could help achieve its broadband and wireless goals. Um, that was the, uh, I think it was Act 48, I can't remember now, um, that established the 248A process. I'm particularly interested in your efforts, Representative Sebelia, um, because it is, uh, continues to be um, an issue that we haven't been able to achieve those goals but I'm here today to tell you um, why adopting deadlines for net metering along the lines of what you did um, for 248A back in 2006 and have continued to evolve that process um, makes sense uh, for net metering so that we can achieve um, state policy objectives. Um, I've worked at the department at a time um, when the Telecommunications Act was passed. Um, we had both the department and the Public Utility Commission, then the Public Service Board, saw um, a, I don't know the percentage, but I would say it was probably in the 500 to 1,000 percent increase in the number of telecommunications filings that came in, certificates of public good to operate, um, uh, consents to uh, transfer control and that kind of thing. Um, we did not, the, the commission, then the board and the department, instead of coming to the legislature, and asking for more money um, or for a change in law, we formed a task force together and worked to figure out a way we could process those applications in a timely way while still meeting the requirements to make sure the companies were financially sound and that kind of thing. Um, and if you go on the website, the PUC's website today, you'll actually see some of the frequently asked questions that I helped draft um, back in the uh, early 2000s. Um, that process has, uh, has worked. So uh, I've also um, spent, after um, uh, some time at the department, I took my box of things and I went across the street to the Vermont Supreme Court where I served as a staff attorney for four years. Um, there I developed a law clerk training program. Um, as a staff attorney, you're responsible for writing um, the rocket docket decisions. So. Um, uh, every uh, month you'd have two weeks to write six decisions in an appeal where you could have paperwork, um, something like this. So I know what it's like um, to be a, a drafter um, of a decision maker's decisions with a very short timeline and a lot of stuff to read. Um, so with that background, I've, well, I've been in private practice now um, on my own since 2013 and uh, I've also served Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. Um, I also served for a time as general counsel of Belco um, during a time when the uh, NRP was under construction and uh, a number of the other um, large infrastructure projects um, were going through both uh, permitting and condemnation. So I have experience, um, a wide variety of experience um, in, uh, uh, in Vermont government and the private sector, and I have been before uh, the legislature in the past testifying on a number of different issues and I'm just, I'm, aside from the fact I'm really happy to be out of my house um, after uh, being uh, held up by this injury, it's just really, uh, I'm delighted to be here to do what I can to help inform your consideration uh, of these bills. 
So if I do that, you can see it back there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the first time I've done this. It wasn't paperless the last time I was here. Um, and you were down in the Ethan Allen room. It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really not. It was really not. That was not a bad uh, yeah. session to spend most of my time, I will say. Um, Okay, why deadlines? And I'm here really about H366 deadlines. Um, my fingerprints are all over that language, um, I'll be honest. Um, this is a um, issue near and dear to my heart because I know the PUC can do better. I know they can. Um, deadlines work. That's one main reason. And the 248A statistics bear that out. Um, I think you'd see that originally the 248A statute um, was uh, adopted to sunset. And uh, it turns out it's the, uh, uh, the only permitting process in Vermont where developers actually have a choice, a forum. You can either go to the PUC or you can go to your local zoning or Act 250. Um, that was built into the process um, to um, give flexibility to telecommunications providers um, so they could get their equipment deployed quickly and cost effectively. Um, I won't. Uh, I think Olivia presented some slides on at least the fiscal 2018 uh, telecommunications filings, which um, uh, when you dig into the data, um, they are uh, uh, many uh, antenna uh, attachments. Um, as I think Mr. Faber had testified before, I do have um, a couple handouts that I'll um, uh, leave you with on what an antenna project can include. Antenna projects can include um, emergency backup generators, um, propane tanks, uh, structures, um, uh, and um, uh, you know other electrical equipment. Some of the um, shelters have HVAC systems and that kind of thing. Um, and there is one that was uh, permitted in the at least one that I found um, permitted in 2000 fiscal year 2018 that includes all of that additional equipment in addition to these just antennas that go through the, um, the process. I'm going to turn back to this first slide um, on uh, as we go through, um, but I want to talk a little, just briefly about the 248A. Um, in 2011, the legislature, um, you all had the opportunity to get some error money, and uh, the legislature looked at what the PUC had been doing with the telecommunications filings um, and learned that their uh, review process that they established pursuant to your direction was working. Um, they had an average of 44 days um, uh, for reviewing and uh, turning around uh, a 248A application, and the longest period um, was uh, 77 days. And that was as a result of modifying the process to distinguish projects not by um, uh, capacity like they are in net metering, but much more about what the physical impact and size. Um, and some of the dimensional requirements, for example, uh, a project may be considered limited size and scope if it's not um, over 150, if it doesn't involve a tower that's over 140 feet tall, that was a determination that something that size, it's 140 feet or less, would be um, uh, considered limited visibility, that kind of thing. If there isn't uh, more than 10,000 square feet of permanent earth disturbance, not the temporary disturbance associated with constructing or uh, access road, temporary access roads, or doing um, uh, the underground conduit for the communications lines and electrical lines, that kind of thing. Um, uh, that was a threshold um, under the requirement for a stormwater permit, and the, um, the process allows projects that meet these sort of dimensional impact requirements um, to go through a more expedited process. Um, and that's, uh, those impacts, um, which you'll see on the slides, um, the, the impacts from a solar project, for example, and a telecommunications facility are not identical, but they're both construction projects. They both require, earth, in most cases, some kind of earth disturbance, impervious surface. Um, with uh, net metering projects, you're not going to have a backup generator that has a, a gas or propane. You're not going to have any buried uh, tanks. You're not going to have um, weekly testing of a generator that runs on fossil fuels. So as a result of the um, uh, 
2011 uh, find it, legislative findings, um, the legislature actually adopted by statute the process that the Public Utility Commission had established for um, telecom towers and uh, other uh, communications equipment um, by distinguishing the different projects based on these, uh, these type, uh, various types of impacts. Um, and what I did to uh, help sort of help you think about why these deadlines can, um, can work, um, I have some, I, I have some, I brought three examples, um, three actual tower projects and three 500 kilowatt solar array projects. Um, when the commission was tasked with implementing 248A and creating this process, um, because there were deadlines, it had to make choices about what was important um, for it to review. Um, and, uh, and as a result, we have uh, success. So for example, um, in this, uh, sorry, I know my leg is shaking. It's, it's, it's just happens. Oh, you'll hear me scream. Um, oh. No, no, it's really not painful. It's the rest of it that's Don't awful. It. <laughs> I mean, hopefully no one's taping this. Right? Yeah, they are. Um, okay. <laughs> so so um, this February, the commission um, approved an uh, 80-foot tall tower on top of a mountain. Um, this actually is at Pico. Um, the location is actually in an area called Rhina. It's rare, irreplaceable natural areas. I look to Billy Coster to tell you a little bit more about what the science is, but it's basically there are a lot of really important things that you want to keep together. There are natural communities. There is an endangered plant um, and a threatened bird species there. The project required 700 feet of tree clearing. It included a 12 by 36 building that was on concrete uh, to house the electronic equipment. Um, and like every one of these towers that isn't, um, if the antennas aren't mo mounted on a pole on a utility line where they can just plug right in, um, they all require a backup generator so that when the power goes out, their customers don't lose service. All of those generators are fueled by uh, fossil fuels. They have to be tested weekly um, and they do only run um, when there's an emergency. This project, like every other 248A and the net metering projects has a 30 day comment period. From the time of filing, there were, you can see the timeline here, there were uh, department A&R comments, um, a petitioner's response, the regional commission weighed in, A&R filed some reply comments, um, and the commission was able to complete its work in 76 days. Um, in August 2018, a 100 foot tall tower was permitted with 2,500 square feet of tree clearing. 5,800 uh, square feet of permanent earth disturbance. Again, another building. This one was on a 10 inch thick concrete pad for the electronic equipment, a 25 kilowatt emergency propane or diesel generator. Um, when it says diesel or propane, um, it depends on what the um, uh, uh, installer ultimately decides to, um, to put in. They don't necessarily specify if it's gonna be this particular uh, propane, depends on whether they're allowed to use diesel. Um, and I'd leave that up to uh, the environmentalists to um, explain more. This one uh, had a 500 gallon propane tank if propane was gonna be used to fuel a generator, 500 square feet of new impervious surface area. Again, a 30 day comment period. Um, this one, a and did not file any comments. The only comments were from the department and uh, neighbors who opposed the, um, the project. Um, the commission was able to um, uh, consider the neighbor's comments and uh, decide the, the case within 50 days. Uh, November 2017, um, this one is a 110 foot tall uh, tower with uh, 8,400 square feet of tree clearing, uh, 3,200 square feet of permanent earth disturbance, um, 2,700 of uh, impervious surface area, Again, another uh, building on a concrete pad, a 35 kilowatt emergency propane or GDs or generator, 1,000 gallon tank. Um, and this one involved a 3,800 foot on a long access road um, with wetlands on both sides. Um, that access road, as I understand it, would be reseeded. But um, if you think that nobody ever goes back to visit the telecom tower, um, 
uh, that I, let me disabuse you of that belief. Um, when equipment needs to be changed out, if there's something that happens with the generator, they still need some uh, some access. So somebody's going to be driving up to that tower. They don't just leave it there to sit. You look like you have a question. I do, I'm, and I'm, I would love to. I, I want to wait until you're done. Okay. I'd like to. I'm anxious to see a couple of questions. Paid, paid I'm no, that's um. It was a gravel. It was a gravel. basically. A, well, I think like dirt. And then, you know, enough so that they could, it's got to be improved enough so they can get that heavy equipment, you know, because it's not a um, 110 foot tall tower um, is, you know, that's not a, a small piece of equipment. Right. <laughs> um, right, exactly. Um, so there has to be some kind of access. Um, so let's turn to the impacts of the 500 kilowatt um, solar project. And I have uh, three for examples. Um, uh, I chose these partly just because I wanted to give you some kind of comparison. Um, it's not to say, just like with the telecom towers, um, that every solar project is the same. They're all a little bit different. Um, the point is that they're not so different <laughs> that experienced uh, regulators who see these things all the time can't look through. And I'm going to leave you with um, copies of filings. This is what they claim they can't do in the, in the time period. This right here. These are your copies, if you like. That's one. <laughs> if you like one, this is for one project, and this is for this is for a project that well, these two projects are in my slides. How big? These are five. These are 500 kilowatt um, solar arrays. These do not include the comment letters. These are just the filing. So this one um, uh, was done in uh, 69 days. It was filed in uh, November of last year. There was 7,800 square feet of shrub and sapling remo removal. It was basically a mowed field and there's like little scrub here and there, so they gotta get that down to put the racks in. Um, 5,000 square feet of impervious, uh, permanent earth disturbance and impervious surface. Three pole-mounted transformers, and when I talk about the pole-mounted transformers, they're the transformers you see outside the building, like around, there's, you know, common. Um, electrical meeting and uh, a disconnect stuff are um, mounted on a panel and James and um, Mike Norris who uh, <coughs> drove me here today, thank you very much, um, basically a big, like a pedestal. stand, yeah. Pedestal. I know it's called a pedestal, but I think of a pedestal like as a table, but now it's kind of like a this and they attach this way. 30-day um, comment period, we had um, the Natural Resources Board, ANR, the Division of Historic Preservation, Department of Public Service, and the Agency of Agriculture all filed comments, and the commission was able to turn that around in 69 days. Can I ask something about the impervious surface? What 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 is considered the impervious surface? So that would be um, like a, a permanent gravel driveway, um, uh, like a gravel turnaround, the actual um, equipment the, itself. Um, you know the the disconnect equipment, um, the it posts. The solar panels themselves. No, 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 the posts that hold the racking that holds the um, the solar panels up, and then the fence posts. And all of the the 500 kilowatt, they have a fence. I just didn't put it in here because I it was late, hmm. honestly, and I figured I could tell you. They all have fences, <laughs> um, unless they're trappers, and the trappers generally don't have uh, fencing. Um, but these are all fixed ground mount. Um, this one had a 30-day comment period, and the reason there's an asterisk there is we had uh, an issue that came up with a &R, and we agreed with a &R to for a two-week period so that we could work out um, the issue that we had. Um, that issue was resolved on August 27th, and we didn't get the CPG until January. It took 202 days. Nothing happened at all between August and January of this year. If there were deadlines, <laughs> um, we would have been able to uh, see this project probably constructed before the end of last year. Uh, the last one, um, and the, the one that I just described, is in that packet of materials, and so is this one. This uh, site was a former rock extraction site. It's actually a, a site that they took rocks to um, help um, after uh, Tropical Storm Irene. And uh, there was really um, the only 
vegetation that had to be removed was some, again, sapling and shrub that grew up over time as it was uh, left uh, undisturbed. Um, about 1,190 feet of permanent um, earth disturbance and impervious surface area. A new gravel turnaround that's included in that impervious surface. Three pole-mounted transformers. Again, the pedestal with the electric equipment. 30-day um, comment period. And as you can see from the timeline, uh, the comment period uh, ended around July 31st, something like that. There was silence until um, uh, October, um, and it took the commission 107 days from the complete filing to um, uh, to do this. And these again are projects where they have the 45-day notice. Actually, um, this last project um, had two 45-day notices, <laughs> and uh, um, and a uh, um, uh, hearing at the local DRB. Um, the many developers will tell you, even though uh, local um, authority is preempted by two, uh, 248, um, some communities really want you to go through their zoning process. Um, and some developers will do that because it's the right thing to do for them and their relationship. Even though the DRB doesn't have authority to say yay or nay, they do have authority to say, yes, we like this project, and that's very helpful when you go to the Public Utility Commission. So in this case, um, uh, the local development review board um, approved the project. I think this is after the second 45-day notice, if I'm right. Um, uh, and the project proceeded. And uh, so, I'm sorry. Yep. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think uh, showing the different projects is uh, it's helpful. I'd like to understand. Um, I think maybe a little bit more uh, on the individual projects where they're getting hung up. I don't know if that's a question for you or for you. See, I would note that I don't find the comparison to 248A particularly helpful. Um, I think 248A has contributed to a pretty significant. Um, expansion of vulnerability in rural Vermont with regard to telecommunications infrastructure. Um, it has allowed our telecommunications companies to build where it's profitable, and I'm actually worried about that. With regard to renewables and our electric utilities, and what we have found with that is in rural areas, their system, the network that is there is deteriorating, and it's costing, you know, it, it's really impacting quality of life. So I'm, I would just caution that I don't know that that's the strongest correlation to make. Um, the comparison of three like size projects in three different areas um, is helpful, and I'd like to understand I think a little bit more about specifically where those get tripped up. Well, I yeah, I been, have been dying to actually talk to you about <laughs> this because I actually the um, the permitting provisions um, that were passed in 2006, the 240A, that was one piece. The problem with deployment, and this is the topic for another uh, uh, hearing on telecom, um, isn't about um, uh, if you don't have um, the, the money to subsidize rural areas. Um, I have been working on this for, well, since 2000 and probably, I've been doing telecom since 1999. Yeah. Um, and my own view, based on that experience, is the only way you're going to achieve and close the gap is with public subsidies in areas where they're needed. You need to shift money from one place to another. It's the only way. Um, uh, and until <laughs> there are, is a will to do that, um, uh, we will not solve the process problem. The permit process isn't the problem. The problem is the fact that it's rural and there aren't enough customers over which to spread the cost. I'm not convinced that the permit process hasn't exacerbated a problem in rural Vermont with telecommunications, but that's a different story. And I, and um, I and I defer to your better judgment. Well, having sit here I, and I wouldn't listen even to bring folks. It up, but you know, it's uh, been the comparison was made. So there's also a federal. Uh, and state regulation difference as well. So the, mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example. The Velco statewide radio project, for example, that it was essential for it to meet its um, uh, the, the safety and communications needs, that would not have been possible without 248A. 
there are some um, really important benefits. And part of that is because they have deadlines. Yeah. So let me go back to that. Um, the reason you have deadlines, and this is coming from someone who has experienced the pressure of having to produce quality work in complicated issues in a short period of time. It's just the way things are. Um, with the deadlines, agencies can prioritize their work. And that's exactly what you see if you look at the EPUC. Um, if, if, if the commission didn't have a deadlines on 248A, I would bet, and I'm not a betting person, I'm very risk averse in that way, um, with my money in that way, I would bet you wouldn't see these things being issued, you know, the bulk of what comes out of the commission. The reason that they do it is because they have to. They have to decide what's important and how are we going to prioritize our work. Maybe it requires them to rethink how they're doing business, very similar to what we did in after the 1999 Telecom um, uh, Act was passed federally when the states were, um, I mean, from all over the country, filings were coming in. Um, what were we to do? Um, we could just continue business as usual and require every telecom company to, to provide, but no, it was what is the most important um, thing that we need to protect the public um, consistent with the fact that we've got all this workload and um, uh, we have other important things to do. Let's revise the system. So can I ask another question? I know we're almost out of time. So we have with plenty of time. Okay. Is it lunchtime? <laughs> <laughs> I got plenty of time. Eat your lunchtime. Uh, the, uh, just with regard to um, getting deadlines, um, accelerating this process, do we... Um, do you believe or think that we are uh, creating any risk in terms of uh, our overall grid and our ability to provide electricity to all Vermonters? In other words, uh, creating any kind of um, imbalance in terms of this transition that might um, harm our utilities, which are required to keep the lights on? So, um like the there's time. well the, yeah there is a um, so there are two sides of that um, one is yeah they are required and there's state policy and everybody knows it <laughs> and you ought to be organizing your work and your resources so that you can meet those objectives so for example if GMP did not install the equipment up in the Shi'i for example um, that it was supposed to that it told the Public Utility Commission in ISO New England it was going to install but didn't do it Whose fault is she at? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so if the, um, if the utilities know that it is important for us to keep the Earth's temperature below two degrees, the rays from below two degrees Celsius within a certain amount of time, or we're faced with just catastrophic consequences, they have the protection from regulators to make sure that they're fulfilling those obligations. If our, and, and this is not a, um, perhaps a popular opinion, but my own personal view is, if it means that my electric bill is gonna go up a little bit because my niece and nephew are gonna have a planet where they can live safely, then I'm really happy for my electric bill to go up a little bit to do that. Um, I, we invested in a net metered system on my house so that we could do what we can to get off fossil fuels. And thank you for some comment for doing a great installation and using um, local labor to do it. My question is just around assessing. We, I mean, we have to think about what are the consequences of the actions that we take, yep. and are we taking them in a way that balances um, what the things that we're trying to do, transform our utility, or our, our, our energy system, and also take care of Vermont, you know, in many ways. Yep. So that's really where my question yeah, is Yeah, and I think, around. Um, and I, um, I don't <laughs> see deadlines <laughs> when, when, and I, the testimony that I heard suggested that the PUC can actually accomplish these goals <laughs> in most cases. So I, um, 
either you decide not to allow projects altogether, or you, if you're going to allow them, you have some kind of predictable process. Customers, the public, even folks that oppose these projects, they have a right to expect a decision within a reasonable period of time. Mm -hmm. For some folks, and this is where you know I, um, I speak with my former staff attorney hat on, the folks that are caught up in, in, a, in a court case or litigation, their lives are affected in ways that people may not understand. And as a, um, working as a staff attorney in support of the court, my job was to do everything I could so that the court could make a decision because somebody was waiting for that. Now, those cases are usually redressing past harms as opposed to trying to, you know, as a gatekeeper for, um, for some uh, uh, permit process for uh, installation of uh, infrastructure. Um, in that case, in my view, timelines are even more important because if you can't get the permit, you can't, you'll never achieve the policy objective. Now, in the case that I showed you with the 202-day turn around, okay, that solar project, I think that what happened, somebody forgot about it. Because finally, I have a process. We wait a little while, and I write what I call, this is Leslie Cadwell's terms, and those who know me know I have all kinds of terms, my nasty gram. Where's the permit? Hello? Did you forget? Now, why would they forget? Well, let me tell you why they would forget. Um, and I actually had an experience where I was at the department, went to the Supreme Court, and came back to the department. A case that I had inherited from somebody before, before I went to the court, I came back from the court four years later, and in my inbox I get a notice of appearance from an attorney in a case that I was like, oh, the Barton Electric? Declaratory ruling? What? Seven years had passed. They forgot about it. The PUC just completely forgot about it. The case had gone, packed up into public records, had never been decided. And it was because uh, I looked, I was like, what happened with this? I make phone calls, and it turned out um, we eventually did get the decision, but they forgot about it. Why did they forget? The Public Utility Commission does not have a case management process. When I issued public records requests to find out how do you, like when a case comes in, what do you do with it? Who gets assigned? What are the timelines? What time do they have to review? Where does it have to go? Who sites check? These are things that the court has, because the court is a, um, just like the PUC, is a um, body of statewide jurisdiction. It doesn't have a discretionary docket. <laughs> um, it has to hear everything that um, comes before it, with the exception of very, very, very few. So uh, in order to manage its work among all five justices, their law clerks, and four staff attorneys, there's a process. <laughs> um, and the court uh, sta uh, chief staff attorney, he knows what's been filed, how long it's been pending, who's holding it up, and why it's being held up. And there's weekly check-ins with everybody at the court to make sure those deadlines. The justices know, I am the justice for these counties for these motions. Um, the motions for um, uh, extraordinary relief, those go to staff attorneys. The staff attorneys in this area gets assigned. The PUC, at least based on the response I got from public records requests, does not have any internal case management procedures to know who has what, why it's held up, how long it's taking. Um, there's no accountability. And that's why if you're gonna, this goes to, if you're gonna have the PUC um, collect more fees because of, from net metering customers, there's got to be some kind of accountability. Otherwise, um, you are um, creating more work because someone's got to collect those fees, manage those fees, track those fees, make sure they get paid without any, uh, without any benefit. Finally, um, in terms of the um, deadlines provide also clear target for performance standards, the committee should be aware that the commission will tell you that it resolves, it meets its performance objectives um, by disposing of a certain amount of cases within a certain, or a certain, the cases, no, this is, the cases that it decides within a certain time are decided within the prescribed time frames, 
Okay. What does that mean? Let me give you an example. This is how the Public Utility Commission reports its performance for budget purposes. If they decide 10 cases, and those 10 cases were all done within prescribed time frames, they get 100%. I'm shouting, sorry. Um, they get 100%. But it doesn't tell you that they actually had 1,000 cases they were supposed to decide. They only decided 10. Should they really get 100% for deciding only 10 of 1,000 cases within the prescribed time? No. The Public Utility Commission's performance standards need to account for how they're actually disposing, what the disposition timelines are, not how good they were at the few things they did. Okay? Um, and I verified that performance standard in a phone call with General Counsel and Ann Bishop because I, when I read it, I couldn't believe that that's what they were reporting to the legislature and to the governor, was look how well we did for the few things we actually got done. So if you have deadlines, they can actually create a performance standard and hopefully a case management process where they can um, have their staff achieving the policy objectives that the legislature established. So may I ask another question? Please. Uh, EP, so you had me on the case management system, uh -huh. but we have EPUC. That's just a okay. So, so tell me, so tell yes. me what's not working. I so love, I love this question. This is a great question. <laughs> so this gets me right into where, like, I, this is like at my group. Don't hurt yourself. No, no. <laughs> See, that, now you understand. The stars all over. Um, so. Um, and this was my fear when they adopted EPUC. And after the first conversation I had with somebody there, I was kind of afraid this is the direction they were going. So let me briefly say, in my pre-law school life, um, I have actually compute. I'm not a computer person. I just love technology. Um, but I have been um, responsible for um, being on a team to computerize the, the last luxury hotel in Boston that went from a manual system to a computerized system. I was on the team to implement that. Um, uh, uh, I have also was on uh, responsible for implementing the document, the document management system when I was general counsel at Velco. Um, that is a tool to interface filings, okay? It is not a case management system. It is an external, it is the, um, how the PUC interfaces with the external world, okay? Very similar to the papers I file, you know, if you file those in the court, the court says you need to put that in these many copies, it has to be done by this time, that kind of thing. Can a I case you? Mm -hmm. Is it a public filing cabinet? Is that what you're calling it? Yeah, it's basically a public filing. Sure. Um, a do it's a docket management system. Mm -hmm. um, there are things, there are tools and reports that you could, if yeah. you designed it well, um, uh, use to help you with these. What I found in doing the stats, and I'm providing some support for Olivia, um, you have to have a lot of time and a burning desire um, and an inability to, to, um, uh, to stop work and enjoy your life with friends um, uh, to figure out the best way to pull the data from EPUC as a member of the public. I don't know what reporting the PUC gets from um, EPUC, but in order for the, the tables that Olivia showed you, that was probably four days of work for me to come up with that, just pulling the numbers out of EPUC. You couldn't do it um, with a, a fast and easy search. The case management system would be, for, or procedures would be, how, once it's filed, what do they do with it? Where does it go internally? What are the deadlines? Um, so for example, when, um, uh, may, I, may I interrupt you? Of again? course. How do you know they don't have a case management system? Because I asked them for okay. it. <laughs> and they said they don't have one. Okay. This is what they gave me. A hearing officer um, evaluate performance evaluation forms. Um, the, the performance measures that they put at the budget, the, you know, we do 10 things really well. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, I was told, I don't think you want our regular personnel policies, like the state personnel policies, like sick leave and all that. Um, and they don't have, there's 
I don't know, Greg can tell, do they have, if, if they have procedures that govern how cases there are assigned, who gets what, what the time frames are reviewing, that's not an external requirement, meaning a rule of civil procedure or the, um, the 248A amended procedures order. These are um, what a, um, a, a person seeking the assistance of the commission or invoking the commission's jurisdiction, what they must do and what the commission does in response. What happens behind the scenes? I have no idea. Um, and the, there is no documentation unless they withheld it from me. I don't think so. They're really awesome like that. They are very responsive with public records requests and really helpful on the phone, um, clarifying information. Um, but that's how I know they don't have a, um, a procedures that govern uh, how they actually get their work done. Okay. So turning to the last slide, second to last slide. So the process that Olivia presented um, that I think came from the PUC, the PUC said they need a minimum of 80 days um, to turn around a net metering petition or application. Um, that means they're saying that once all comments and all issues are resolved, they need at least 50 days, <coughs> a minimum, to decide it. And I don't, that's just not reasonable. Um, they should be able to turn it around in 30. If the person assigned reviews it and they have a template for a decision, because there's boilerplate language in every single one of these, um, the person writing the decision can actually get a head start. In fact, the party filing these for these 500s actually has to file a proposed decision, so there's one already written. Um, for a while, when the commission was still using word perfect, because I'm a believer in doing everything I can to help my clients to remove barriers to get projects built, um, it was part of my job at Velco was to remove obstacles to get sticks in the ground, so to speak. Um, uh oh, I lost my train of thought. Word perfect. Word perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I actually bought Word Perfect and had the word perfect version, I would have all of our proposed decisions done in word perfect so that they didn't have to worry about conversion. When I found out that some hearing officers liked word perfect and others were using word, it was like, what format can I send it so that it's easy for you to get it written and decided? Um, so uh, they only need 30 days. Thank you. Thanks, Mr.